Very warm welcome to everyone to the Education Innovation Awards 2022, organized by Entrepreneur India. My name is Bhavna Bhatia and I shall be your host for the day. The Education Innovation Awards in its second virtual edition recognizes people in and around education for outstanding contributions in transforming education through technology to enrich the lives of learners everywhere. The event is supported by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India and National Informatics Centre. The event is hosted by Entrepreneur India. We'd like to thank all our partners for their association and support. And also we'd request all our delegates to keep posting questions through the Q&A option. We will try and answer most of the questions by our esteemed speakers if time allows. Well, with this, it is time for me to invite Ms. Ritu Maria, Editor-in-Chief, Entrepreneur Media India and Asia Pacific and Franchise India to give the welcome note. Thank you, Ms. Maria, for joining us. Over to you. Thank you, Bhavna, and a very good morning to all of you. And uh, I warmly welcome everybody to the in Education Conference, uh, Education Innovation Conference and Awards here today. Um, certainly, uh, this is the first education gathering that is happening in the new year of 2022. And we only look forward to the industry being, um, you know, more, uh, it, uh, so the new things happening in the industry as we go ahead. So I think that the pandemic and particularly the national education policy that was announced in uh, 2020 have brought such far reaching changes in the entire education sector. So particularly in the K-12, if we look at a uh, five plus three plus three plus four structure and the role of regulators and how uh, uh, you know, they are powerful and yet more meaningful they are becoming with the policy. Uh, it's only uh, tells us in long term that there are far reaching changes that will happen in the education sector than ever before. But however, you know, if you look at a pandemic and the way we have moved to online education to hybrid education, we also get to notice that uh, there are no common template has come into existence um, when we want to educate students remotely, you know, uh, the point is that sometimes we're getting them back to the classroom, sometimes we are trying to create a hybrid model, sometimes we're going virtual only, or sometimes even both. Uh, so I think we are probably suffering from a classic dilemma of short term challenges, but I think in the long term, certainly the future for education sector is only uh, beautiful and bright. Now, understandably, 2021 was a major learning curve for students, parents and educators when they were, uh, when as teaching moved online. But I think the second wave and now, of course, the third wave has bought the efficacy of the use of online um, as a great tool for getting education. And I mean, not just at the school level, but probably higher education level and even the lifelong learning level. Now, the question is really not about uh, giving digital education, which was perhaps the haunting question uh, from 2015 to 2018, 19 about the adoption of digital education, I think that part has already got settled. But however, what we need to uh, be able to uh, comprehend now is how effective we can make digital education. So the transformation um, for educational institutions from here on is not going to be an interim activity or not something that they will only do because it is um, good to have, but it is important to have. And that is where I think a complete journey for um, uh, educational or hybrid education will continue or begin to evolve as we try to look at this medium of education or online medium of education as the uh, right way or an integral way of um, education structure. Now, what is the end goal of doing all of this? The end goal really eventually boils down to the fact that we need a student who is more empowered uh, with not school or the screen, but rather, as I said, in a hybrid uh, system of education. It also means that the education will uh, need to ensure that more personalized learning is um, there to happen. And uh, you know, it's important, uh, I think the education, the online education space has given us that power that we are able to give that personalized data-based understanding of a student can be created and therefore the education and the uh, things that he needs to learn can be crafted according to his particular needs rather than uh, one education delivery template for all the students. Um, I'm particularly very excited to see uh, this happening uh, where in, you know, where student will stand the course of his or her learning in times to come. Now, while this is the scene on the K-12 education scene, 
Um, on the other hand, particularly on the higher, higher education side, I feel that there will be seismic changes that will be seen, um, as I like to call it the post-secondary education. And, um, you know, because it is, uh, I think the student who has really rejected the in the last two years, and probably that's going to be the way forward, is the time and the place-based education model. And edtech companies, of course, further have gone um, away ahead, and they are creating low-cost degrees, delivering competency-based education, and also, uh, you know, focusing on growing populations that are underrepresented in the entire education sector and therefore offering pioneering subjects and certifications, which earlier we never used to see in uh, universities or higher educational institutes. And probably that's going to be the wave of the future uh, as students want degrees that will give them jobs um, in current digital environments. So overall, I think the education just doesn't end after the school or the college anymore. Um, in an era where of, uh, of tech disruption that we are sitting in now, lifelong learning is really the way to be. And I think if we want to safeguard our jobs for the future or want to be future ready, then we have to imbibe our student self in us. All of us need to do it and keep on continuously learning new things in order to be relevant uh, to the professional industry, to the work industry in times to come. So keeping, I think, this large education scenario, uh, which is changing very fast in mind, I would welcome you today at the Indian Education um, Congregation here. And we have education uh, leaders who are going to be speaking during the course of the day. Um, and some of them um, have really done some path-breaking work um, in the ed tech sector. And they're going to be telling us as to what is the future of education sector. Uh, and but, you know, uh, in one sense, I'm looking forward to this conference and the speakers uh, giving us, uh, you know, their insights because we have speakers coming from both the worlds of education, both from the edtech side as well as from the educational institution side. And they would, I think, probably from what they say is where we're going to get the right idea about how they are rewriting the dynamic new world, which is uh, heading towards and uh, which we are all heading towards. And um, of course, there's also going to be the Education Innovation Awards, uh, wherein we will recognize some of the most forward thinking organizations in the education industry today. Uh, so again, you know, there are multiple sessions for you to look forward to and there are top leaders who will join us and uh, share their insights. Um, you know, if you have questions, please keep on posting on the chat box. Please do not wait for the session to end as we would be, uh, we would be having many sessions uh, and uh, we would be very, very uh, punctual about the time since this is the education sector conference. Um, so I would suggest whatever suggestions, questions you have, please keep on adding it in the chat box uh, so that we're able to take it up with the panel as we go along this conference. Particularly if you have any questions that you would uh, like to ask me, uh, I'm always available on LinkedIn. Uh, kindly reach out to me over there also. I'm looking forward to spending a wonderful day with all of you, uh, some very productive discussions and some, um, you know, ideas that will, of course, cater the future of education. Um, so have a wonderful day ahead. And uh, certainly, uh, as I said, we've just started in January 2022. And this fall, probably the discussions here today will charter the course of how the education sector will be in the years year, uh, particularly for this year and the future years to come. Welcome once again. Over to you, Bhavna. Thank you so much, Ms. Mara. Always an honor and pleasure hearing you. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, it is now time to have the opening keynote by Vamsi Krishna, CEO and co-founder with Antu on the topic access, connectivity and opportunities for students and ad tech founders reflection on the passion for and readiness to enact digital transformation for learners amid uncertain times. Well, Vamsi Krishna is the CEO and co-founder of Vedantu, India's leading online tutoring company, which enables students to learn live with some of India's best curated teachers. Vamsi, along with his friends, now fellow co-founders Pulkit Jain and Anand Prakash had founded their first education venture called Lakshya in 2006. Lakshya was subsequently acquired by MT Educare in, 2020, uh, in 2012. Post the acquisition, they founded Vedantu, which has now emerged as India's leading interactive online edtech player across K-12 and competitive test prep. Well, with this, it is time now to bring Vamsi Krishna on the screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Vamsi, CEO and co-founder of Vedantu, and it's great to be here talking to all you folks. Education and edtech especially 
has gone through a, a massive, massive upsurge in the, especially in the last two years. EdTech has been there for over a decade. We have been talking and implementing a lot of technological innovations around education technology. It started off with as, as early as when radios and televisions came about to as recent as when smart classes and all these new innovative stuff was being experimented in schools. But very honestly, I would say I really saw as an entrepreneur being in education for over 16 years, I saw the adoption of uh, educational technology and tech for the consumer side peaking out in the last three, four years and COVID has further accelerated it even beyond proportions. So that's a great thing. And as an entrepreneur myself, uh, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful time to be in this industry and uh, doing some innovative work in the space. As Vedantu, I remember clearly we started with first live online class way back in 2014. And personally, as an entrepreneur, nothing is more satiating and satisfying to see a category which you know one could be created becoming mainstream. And now not just um, B2C private ed tech companies, but even schools and colleges all adopting and doing live classes during the COVID times. So those are the exciting stuff. But I say it's very, very, very early. Uh, many people ask me this, like, you know, is this the peak of edtech and after COVID, will it go down? Uh, very honestly, uh, guys, I can tell you that with stats first, even right now, with all this stuff which we hear around edtech and edtech adopt, uh, adaption, uh, we, all the online educational companies combined, and I can talk to you about the Katewell numbers, and I'm very sure that similar numbers would be post Katewell as well, but in Katewell, out of the total available target group, which is around 80 to 90 million uh, households who have had access to internet, who can afford devices, who have a household income of, you know, of, uh, of greater than an amount which provides this affordability, uh, that 80 to 90 million households, the edtech overall online education is probably somewhere on the, you know, middle single digit penetrations, right? Around four or five. And that's, that's today. The total TG is actually even beyond that. There are around 8, 280 to 300 million kids uh, and households in, in India, just in Katefield, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, online education and edtech is so underpenetrated even as of today. And that I see is the massive opportunity and a place of innovation for all the edtech companies, including Vedanto and all the other edtech companies, that there is almost 95% of the TG still remains untapped, underpenetrated. And that is where I see the next wave of innovations coming up, wherein you need to reduce the cost. You need to think about more innovative models where, uh, because not all you know, people would require same set of offerings, right? So offering innovations, price innovations, model innovations, all of those things are something which you will see coming up in the next two to three years. So it's far from over. In fact, it just got begun. And if, if like, you know, if you look at Southeast Asia, uh, and the kind of edtech penetrations there are, it's just massive. It's 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 high twenty percent kind of a penetration and growing. So India is is an infancy. I think we are just got started. The COVID has really give us gave a, a a big boost to the brand awareness of this category. But I think the job is way far ahead to like you know in front of us. I think all education companies and more education companies we will see doing a lot of innovative stuff in this. Right. That's on one. The second thing which for me personally, you know, it's very exciting is to see the impact of education and edtech, especially going into the tier two, tier three, tier four. That's fun. Uh, it's already there. It's already happening. But again, the impact uh, purely because of the device affordability and internet penetration is still limited out there, right? And I think that is where the impact of edtech is going to be more felt. Not saying that in metros and top 10, top 15, top 20 cities, it won't be there. It is there, but still fundamentally you have an access there. If you go out, you still have teachers, you still have access to some good content. But in tier three, tier four locations, even if you are wanting to do this, or if you're ready to pay, even then you do not have access to good teachers, good content. And that is the next area where I see not just a massive penetration to happen, but also impact to be much more there as compared to probably the, you know, the metros in the top 10, 15 cities. So that's going to be a trend 
which we will see right and a subtrend of that would be more penetration into vernacular languages as a as a consequence of this so largely today even today i would say tech including vedanto is majorly focused on you know the top languages like hindi english and few other top languages i think vernacular is one big area where for a diverse country like india uh, you know for education to happen at a last mile we have to go there and that is a second probably a way where you will see lot of uh, you know innovations and product iterations to happen uh, with respect to uh, not just you know online education at tech but even in offline sort of setup so that's the th second way the third way which i think is very interesting and this is purely because of covid i would say uh, it was it was not big before that but in covid i am sure as all of us would have witnessed lot of schools lot of colleges lot of formal educational institutions have have been forced to adopt uh, you know educational technologies and uh, and and after even after covid i don't see that trend completely getting shut off yeah because schools have experienced this they have been exposed to this and uh, and lot of innovative hybrid models will emerge so that's the third way which i feel we will see in the next 2 to 3 years wherein as the covid recedes it will not happen definitely schools i think students are going to go back to schools there's no two ways around it uh, i get asked this question quite a lot that will you know will will this thing um, continue to operate in a complete hybrid or online method for formal schools it won't be at all right because there are a lot of reasons behind it cognitive skills is not the only thing which schools are responsible to generate right? there are a lot of non cognitive skills also which comes from social interactions games you know arts main bunch of stuff what i have seen personally is uh, online education are great in doing cognitive skill development stuff which is you know clearly around academics and related activity but when it comes to social you know physical those things you still require that you know uh, that offline play and that is where schools that's the responsibility of schools any which ways and that is where they do a good job as well and that yet cannot be you know completely replaced by online so hence it would happen that the students will go back but will it be 100% that is something which is very interesting and needs to be seen because what i believe is because they are now exposed to educational technologies there will be lot of innovative uh, solutions wherein let's say 60% or 70% in school and 30% even at home uh, there is some stuff going on uh, homeworks uh, other engagement activities because the schools are now exposed to these tools i i, I re really see them uh, continuing to use this to making their own systems and processes more efficient and you know at the end of the day adding more value for the for the student uh, the framework to think about it at least in my opinion is to keep the student at the center and think about what is best for him or her and designing solutions around that uh, and that is something to watch out for uh, one of the classical problems and the challenges which i see lot of educational companies and off offline companies making is imposing solutions on, on on a child right i think technology is just an enabler what is important is to think student first here in all these circumstances and situations and design a solution around student uh, it can have on an online component it can have an offline component it can have a technology component it can not have a technology component doesn't matter but the the framework which ultimately succeeds and does great is having the student the center and designing stuff around it so i can give you an example on this way back in 2014 when vedanto was starting its like you know doing live classes i mean we were laughed about on this because at that time almost everyone was doing asynchronous recorded video content delivery and the reason why we did this is not because we wanted to do it it's just because having been in education and being a teacher before that for 8 9 years you know the founders uh, realized that if we want to create a, a a pure online scalable solution which creates learning outcomes yeah it has to be an interactivity led right where has to be an interaction and that is why that solution was designed so i i am a big believer of this and my also suggestion to all the future uh, edupreneurs both online and offline is to have that framework in mind and that always serves them yeah. uh, it was lovely interacting with you all and uh, all the best for all your future endeavors thanks a lot well thank you so much mr krishna on that wonderful uh, note all right so ladies and gentlemen we do have uh, our next session all set uh, we're looking at talking about 
the School EdTech Solving India's core education problem. We are joined by Sumit Mehta, CEO and co-founder lead. Sumit uh, being the co-founder and chief executive officer of Lead, India's foremost player in school EdTech category with a network of 1.2 million plus students across 3,000 schools and adding 300 schools a month currently. Well, with this, uh, I'd like to welcome Sumit uh, on the platform. Thank you, Sumit, for joining us. With this, the stage and screen is all yours. Over to you. Thanks, Bhavna. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes, Sumit, we can. All right. Uh, uh, this is great to be here on in the Education Innovation Summit. Uh, let me just share a few slides and you know talk about uh, how School EdTech is solving India's core education problems. Uh, can you could you enable screen sharing? Can we get the team to please enable the screen sharing for Mr. Mehta? Yeah. So look, uh, I guess uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, investment and interest has happened over the last few years on uh, EdTech in India, uh, and interestingly, a lot of that interest has uh, gone towards what I call consumer edtech, which is uh, supplemental education. And the whole idea there has been to circumvent uh, schools, uh, you know, and and go directly to students with the belief that it's almost impossible to transform schools in India because it is a 70, 80 year old problem. A lot of people have tried it in the past. And the new wave seems to assume that, you know, uh, through tuitions, homework, help and test prep, you know, we will be able to give our students a leg up. And our, our thought and our learning has been that uh, that's that's important uh, but not sufficient uh, because while it while what it does is it gives uh, students uh, what I call a band aid uh, and sometimes a leg up in terms of you know clearing the important uh, entrance exams, it doesn't solve the core fundamental problem in India, which is that uh, India has one of the largest school going student population in the world. Uh, I sometimes joke that. You know, if Indian school going students were a country by themselves, they'll be the fifth largest country in the world. That's how big the Indian school going population is. Uh, but the challenge uh, is that, you know, the, the quality of schooling which is made available to these 270 million students is not up to the mark. Um, and, and the opportunity, uh, you know, which is the other side of the coin is that these students end up spending six to seven hours in school every day. And I sometimes wonder that, you know, uh, if we are able to ensure that those seven hours, those six hours are spent meaningfully uh, in learning the essential mindsets, habits and uh, life skills that students require to succeed in life, the potential and the possibility of what we can do for the country is, is sometimes uh, mind numbing, right? Uh, and, and that's why I feel that, you know, school edtech has the potential to really make a big difference in core education. Like I said, uh, despite 270 million kids going to uh, school, uh, a lot of innovation that we've heard about, you know, and celebrated has happened outside of schools and colleges, you know, and a lot of the, uh, you know, companies we've celebrated in the past have actually worked outside uh, the institutes, whether it is higher education or even K-12. Uh, and the intent really is that, you know, we improve students' uh, skills in math, science, uh, get them to do better in uh, CET, JE, NEET, uh, and, and, and that's that's enough. Uh, but however, uh, you know, when you look at these, uh, a lot of these solutions, the thing that has uh, bothered us in the past is that a lot of focus is on uh, user adoption, engagement, the typical, uh, you know, tech measures, uh, you know, basically measuring how many students are uh, free and how many students are paid, uh, how many, how much time do they spend on the app. Uh, are they coming back and attending uh, attending the the next session so adoption uh, retention engagement these are the metrics that are uh, typically you know both uh, monitored and and shared and uh, learning outcomes seem to be conspicuous by their absence uh, and that surprises me because you know what we have learned uh, over the last 10 15 years is that in education and in edtech uh, Saraswati precedes Lakshmi and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, a quite a profound insight that uh, just like when you go to a restaurant, you know, uh, ultimately if the food is not good, you're not going to come back again. Similarly, you know, in education, if the learning outcomes are not there, because that's the core purpose of education, if students are not learning, uh, they're not developing the mindsets and skills that will require that they require to succeed in life, uh, they will 
they will not pay fee they will not come back uh, and if that doesn't happen you know the the company's commercial success is going to be under question and if that's uh, under question then you know investments and valuations will be under question so all the lakshmi metrics you know of commercial success always follow the saraswati metrics of learning outcomes in education and in the short term you know through glitz and glamour and publicity you know one might be able to get good adoption but in the long term ultimately you know parents and students have to see a meaningful difference in their learning ability in their learning outcomes for sustained success uh, you know in in edtech and uh, if this has to happen ultimately schools are critical because like i mentioned earlier uh, a child spends 6 hours in a school every day and uh, a school is not only a place for academic learning it is a place for whole child development so you know the 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 research on this is pretty solid that for a child to achieve success in life uh, board exam results are important but not sufficient uh, you know a child requires what we now call 21st century skills you know whether it is collaboration critical thinking communication uh, and, and even mindsets of grit and perseverance you know this is what a, helps a person succeed in life and school is the perfect laboratory uh, crucible whatever you want to call it uh to develop these skills and mindsets and these skills and mindsets cannot be done uh, you know through a one line online one hour online class uh, and that's why uh it is critical that you know we we transform our schools uh because the potential that a school has to develop a whole child to do deep impact uh, cannot be matched by supplemental education that's why school edtech uh now there are three important words in school at tech you know there is school there is ed and there is tech and sometimes in ed tech you know we we tend to just focus on the tech part but we need to understand that in this uh, in this term school at tech there are three real important entities so let's just explore them one by one on why they are important uh, because that will be really helpful for us to appreciate why school at tech is important to solve india's core education uh, problem so let's take school first the the real challenge that indian schools have you know and india has uh, the largest number of schools in the world in 1.5 million even if i leave out the million government schools there are half a million private schools in the country uh, unfortunately uh, the challenge in these schools is that most of them are afflicted by poor teacher skill uh, india uh, conducts like a national uh, teacher eligibility test every year and you'll be surprised or maybe not surprised to know that uh close to 90 95% of our teachers fail this test uh you know we all know the quality of our bed program which prepares teachers for uh, for uh, uh teaching and uh, the the quality of that bed program is uh, neither consistently high across all bed uh, institutes and the bed program also you know for the longest time has not been upgraded uh so what it leaves us with is that majority of our students are faced with a teacher in the class who herself requires major upskilling major empowerment you know they are stuck with 19th century tools and they preparing kids for the 21st century and that equation in itself is a recipe for disaster and therefore schools require major reimagination in terms of how do they upgrade uh, teacher skills uh, because that one lever can actually make a massive difference in how uh schools can fulfill the need of preparing students for tomorrow the second challenge is that you know because india has so many schools uh the the consequence of it is that each school is small enough and therefore does not have the capacity for innovation uh if you travel to schools in tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 towns you will see that they are basically a combination of uh different lecture halls connected through a corridor uh and you know the school learning that you and i uh, went through 30 years back uh, and our parents went through uh, 70 years back a lot has not changed a teacher is still standing in front of the blackboard and you know giving a 40 minute lecture and then turning her back towards the students and writing answers of the book back questions on the blackboard and students simply copy those question answers in their notebook and they committed to memory and when there is exam time they reproduce those answers and this charade of learning continues you know year on year till the student either hits the board exam or a job interview and that's when they realize that 
the 10 or 13 years of schooling that they went through really hasn't amounted to much because they haven't developed core concepts they haven't developed core mindsets and skills and fundamentally you know school is different from a uh, consumer at tech where it is about beaming a class it's a complex ecosystem you know there are multiple stakeholders there's the teacher the principal the school owner parent student uh, and, and there are uh, different layers of operations you know the teaching learning process the school operations process the parent engagement process so it's not an easy one to solve but unless we reimagine how schools are going to run in the country we will not be able to truly unlock the potential of our country so that's that's the opportunity and that's the challenge in in schools now let's talk about the the ed part uh, ed requires major transformation the data is out there for all of us to see you know we all know that only the one time india participated in in pisa it ranked 72 out of 73 uh, it was a matter of national embarrassment and we stopped participating as if you know closing our eyes to the problem will make the problem go away well it doesn't uh, asa does this uh, assessment every year to show that grade 5 students who can do grade 3 math are only 28% grade 5 students who can read grade 3 english are only 50% uh, and i am only talking about academic learning outcomes you know readiness for life is actually absent from most of our schools and curriculum so uh, what we teach and how we teach requires major transformation in our schools so that's the ed part and lastly if i talk about tech tech has been largely absent from our schools you know apart from the hardware based smart class solution you know schools have been resistant to resistant to tech because uh, the teacher skill has been poor to uh, accept it and you know school themselves have been small enough to absorb uh, any major technological innovation so they are stuck with traditional teacher training traditional books lecture based teaching uh, lecture halls for classrooms Uh, so not much seems to have cha- uh, changed in uh, in the classroom of a traditional school in the last 60 70 years and that's why if we put this to- thing together you know uh, school requiring reimagination education requiring transformation and tech requiring adoption uh, that's what we basically uh, brought together uh, as lead and our thing was that you know if we have to really uh, transform schools we have to start with the outcome uh, a lot of solutions in the past have been focused on inputs saying you know you implement a smart class you implement a computer lab you implement this curriculum uh, and things will happen but fundamentally the the school processes the teaching learning processes would not change uh, the the school at tech approach that lead has been uh, driving across the country is giving a mastery guarantee for schools saying if you uh, implement this system the learning outcomes in your school will increase by 20 to 25% in a proven manner uh, and then whatever is required to be done to achieve that the system will take care of it now that's a pretty radical uh, proposition never been done before in b2b uh, school edtech across the world uh, but thankfully you know we've been able to deliver on it uh when students come to a lead powered school they come with 1.7 years of gap in their english levels uh which is the data that you see on the left uh part of your screen and then across uh, 24 months we are able to reduce that 1.7 years gap to zero uh because elga which is the english language and general awareness program that lead implements uh is a skill based program which accelerates students uh, english uh, skills uh, and gets them to grade level now when you are going to an english medium school this is uh, this is amazing because now you are able to read math and science and social studies in the in the medium of your instruction uh, and that's why elga reducing the english skill gap uh, in 24 months is is magical for schools now the if you look at the graph on the right hand side when we start working with the school a typical class composition is that only 29% of students are above the 70% mastery mark and in 6 to 9 months we are able to radically change the classroom uh, composition by having 70% of students above the 70% mastery mark and that has a big impact in the classroom engagement classroom participation because now majority of the people are above the 70% mastery mark now these are uh, outcomes that you know we uh, have consistently been able to deliver across schools and my 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 reason for sharing this is that if we are able to really transform student learning uh, in in schools then 
we're talking about real transformation and this happens at the back on the back of teacher transformation uh, the solution that leap provides to teachers really upgrades their skills so you know if you look at uh, when when the teachers begin teaching the lead system their uh, uh, rating in terms of performance is like a 2 out of 5 uh, but one year post lead they move to 4 out of 5 which is uh, again amazing for a school because ultimately we all know that the quality of learning is uh, cannot exceed the quality of teaching uh, so therefore empowerment of teachers is very important and this reflects in teachers feedback which can, kind of continues to improve uh, so fundamentally what we've been able to implement is a, a integrated system uh, which has a comprehensive curriculum stack a pedagogy which is tailored for high learning outcomes a tech system which is uh, enabled for scale an excellent outcome for all stakeholders and if we do that i mean it's not done for one two three schools this is a system now which is working at scale uh, and a scale that is unprecedented you know 5000 partner schools 2 million uh, students across 500 cities and my hope is that if we are able to have more innovation flow to school transformation because there are one and a half one and a half million schools in this country half a million private schools we are still serving only one percent you know in the long term we want to be able to serve 20 percent 60,000 schools in the country uh, but but there is more innovation required to ensure that our schools uh, become better because if our schools become better then our students will become better and nothing can be better for the future of a country than transforming schools. Uh, and that's why I continue to say that, you know, school tech, ed tech is critical uh, to improve the core education in the country. Uh, that's what I wanted to share, Bhavna. I would love to take any questions from the audience if there are. Sure. Uh, so, Sumit, uh, just in an interest of time, we've got a certain set of awards uh, we'd love to, you know, have your presence with. Uh, so, could we uh, get on to that? Because our winners and everybody are waiting in the back. Uh, I'm happy to go by what you uh, would like to do, Havna. Sure. Thank you, Subit. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, we're going to be starting with the first set of awards. So, I'll just request the uh, team to kindly do the uh, preset now on the screen. And let's see who the winners are as in interest of time. Let's get on to that right now. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see on the screen, uh, we've got our first uh, category, which is displayed, which is EdTech Deployment of the Year K-12. And that goes to LEAD School. So congratulations, uh, Sumit uh, Hartke's congratulations. We'd love to hear your uh, uh, you know, acceptance speech on uh, that. Over to you. Thanks, Bhavna. Like I said, I think this is uh, this is a really good, strong validation for uh, you know what I was saying, which is that uh, ultimately, if India has to do well, its schools have to become better, and you know we are really, really glad uh, and privileged to play a small part uh, in that. Uh, so I would uh, dedicate it to our school partners, students, and teachers who have given it their best in in delivering strong outcomes uh, for students across the across the country. Absolutely. Congratulations uh, to you and your team, uh, Sumit. And uh, let's move on with this uh, to our next uh, category. Our next preset, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, the best classroom tech uh, solution of the year hardware, and that goes to Globus Infocom Limited. Congratulations to the entire team of Globus Infocom uh, Limited. And could we request our dignitary to kindly uh, join us on the screen? which is uh, Kirandam, who is the CEO. Kirandam, congratulations to you and your team. Uh, with this, we request your acceptance, please. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this award because awards are a great motivation. We are do trying to do our bit. So a big thanks to the jury, first and foremost, for uh, giving us this honor. And uh, we humbly accept this award. And uh, last year, we did uh, 10,000 Smart Classroom Solutions uh, Pan India, which included the rural areas as well, because our strength is that we want to make technology accessible to one and all. And we are trying to make that accessible. We are trying to transform the classroom environments into uh, a highly immersive and engaging atmosphere. So thank you so much for this honor. Absolutely. Congratulations on that. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, we move on to the next category. The next please have please. Well, the best e-learning blended or flipped solution goes to Virohan. Uh, congratulations to the entire team out there. And uh, may I request uh, Nalin Saluja, 
founder and CTO of Rowan to kindly join us on the screen now. Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for the award. Uh, I think it's uh, it's an amazing validation again uh, from uh, Entrepreneur India to uh, uh, to recognize the work that Birhan's been doing. And uh, I think uh, along the lines of what Sumit was saying earlier, uh, Virohan is uh, the in-institute uh, solution uh, for the higher education uh, industry. And we could not agree more uh, on the importance of live interactions in the classroom and the importance of a teacher. Um, that's what we are leveraging to transform higher education, focusing on the healthcare sector to begin with. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Bhavna, for the award. Thank you and congratulations to the team out there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now with this, let's move on to the next one, which is Emerging Technology Solution, and that goes to Edubrisk. So congratulations to Edubrisk on uh, that, and may I request uh, Saju Arwin, CEO of Edubrisk, to kindly join us now. Thank you. Uh, very good, uh, good morning to all. I'd like to thank uh, Edupreneur uh, and the members of the jury for uh, giving us this honor. Uh, you know, as one of, one of the speakers told today, it is not an easy journey to bring in technology innovation into schools, uh, right. you know, it, it, to make the schools in, invest their time, energy, money in upskilling the teachers to get into analytics based interventions, uh, ICTs, uh, then data science and uh, neuroscience elements. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I would like to especially thank the partner schools across seven states and in India and Middle East, who not only joined us early on, but gave us the constant feedback uh, to, to make it suit to a school environment. So once again, thank you. And I would like to thank the member team of Edubris team who believed in this vision and mission and to make quality education affordable, equitable. Thank you. Right. Congratulations on that. Uh, well, with this, uh, for the final award in this set, let's find it out. The New Age Institutions Providing Online Degree, and that goes to SPJN School of Global Management. With this, I'd now like to invite Dr. Christopher Abraham, CEO and Head of Dubai Campus, to kindly join us. Thank you very Dr. much, Lorna. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Yeah. Thank you so much for this honor. Humbled, of course and uh, privilege to receive this on behalf of the school. I think for the last 18 years, we've uh, actually started making a lot of innovations. Much before COVID, we had invested in technology and on online. In fact, the cutting edge technology called ELO, for which I think we've been recognized, talks about a very key element in uh, online learning, which is engaged learning. So how do you use technology to engage students? I think it's the number one prerogative. So we are honored to receive this award and uh, we want to thank the jury and of course entrepreneur uh, magazine for uh, recognizing us and certainly would go a long way in making many more milestones thank you very much absolutely thank you so much dr christopher well with this uh, mr mehta just your words uh, towards the end of our first set of uh, awardees whom you witness any any thoughts on that please I think, like I said, uh, education requires as much innovation as it as it can get, and I'm really glad to see uh, you know so many companies attacking the challenge of uh, you know improving schools and uh, higher ed institutions. I continue to believe that we have to make our institutions stronger and better, whether it is schools, colleges, and universities. And the more innovation that flows there, the better it is for the country. So, all the best to all the winners. Uh, this was really exciting, and let's continue doing the good work. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Mario. Your yeah, thoughts, no, I just want to congratulate all the winners and I think some wonderful work happening in the edtech space. And thank you, Sumit, for joining us and congratulations on the award too. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Now, well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, it is time now to move on to our next discussion. Once again, congratulations to all the winners and thank you, Sumit, for joining us. Well, with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is time now to move on to our next panel, which is building an effective learning ecosystem scalability and personalization how to balance the two, making education non-linear and flexible. Well, with this, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, to the session, first up, our uh, moderator, who's going to be Mr. Ritu Maria, Editor-in-Chief, Entrepreneur Media India and Asia Pacific and Franchise India, who's going to be uh, the session chair and the moderator of uh, this panel discussion. We're joined by our speakers, Akshay Chaturvedi, CEO and co-founder, Leverage Edu, Hari Krishnan Nair, co-founder, Great Learning, uh, Ashutosh Kumar, CEO and co-founder, Testbook.com, uh, Akshay Munjal, 
founder and CEO Hero uh, Wide. We've got Falgun Kompali, the co-founder Upgrad, and Kashi Abdalal, co-founder and CEO of Simply Learn. Well, with this, I'd like to humbly welcome all our panelists on the stage and screen. And uh, Ms. Mara, over to you to take on the live reign and take forward the discussion. Thank you, Bhavna. And what a stellar planner to be speaking to here today uh, on this Monday morning. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Of course, uh, given the diversity of this panel, I would like to keep our discussion focused more on uh, higher education and lifelong learning, and therefore would request all our audience to um, stick to questions which would pertain to that and also to the kind of work that is being done by our uh, panelists. Um, so indeed, higher education, I think, saw its very first changes probably somewhere in the 19th and 20th century when, you know, industrial revolution was in place and, um, you know, the industries at that point of time that were emerging required a certain kind of talent um, pool uh, for the businesses that were being built. And I think the next set of revolution has come now, which is in the 21st century, when higher education is again being transformed and this time it is to serve the needs of a global digital knowledge economy. And um, now, given that scenario, um, I'm going to ask my panelists to share their thoughts. I'm going to start with Akshay Chaturvedi first. Um, um, Akshay, most welcome to the panel. And you know, hi, Ritu. Hi. Um, so you know, something I'd like to know from you is that how do you think COVID has changed um, the approach towards higher education for Gen Z, particularly in the COVID times? What has changed permanently from their uh, perspective? What are their current priorities today as students when they look at um, wanting to take higher education and they come to your platform for it? So let's start sure. with that and maybe you know, I'll pop some more questions to you. Sure, Ritu. No, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here today and uh, great to be uh, on stage with such a distinguished panel. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, at Leverage Ritu, we are a study abroad platform. We help about close to... Uh, uh, 20, we helped 23,000 students last year uh, head abroad uh, and uh, largely I think one, I, I would essentially flip your question as well. I'll talk about what changed and what did not change as well. Uh, what changed was that uh, students are now way more outcome focused than they were before, right? Uh, there's a very clear understanding that I am not pursuing higher education to collect a damn degree or certificate in my hand. Uh, I need it to be more outcome focused. I need it to essentially have employability at the end of it. Uh, I'm pursuing higher education because I want to read somewhere. Uh, so in fact, on our platform, when we, we have about close to 400 plus counselors as well. And our counselors now essentially tell students that, uh, boss, if you're putting 15 lakh rupees, 20 lakh rupees, 25 lakh rupees to go to one of these countries, uh, be it Australia or UK or Canada or the US, uh, these, are the kind, these are the four different kinds of jobs that peers like yours have uh, already got in the last one or two years. This is what you can kind of also get. Uh, this is how you'll get financing. And this is what you kind of actually can see yourself making by the end of two or three years. So I think it's very, very important that uh, we as education companies, we as I would say, uh, I call ourselves a mobility company, uh, uh, not just another tech company, uh, because essentially helping people kind of be mobile between uh, destination A to B. So I think that does that uh, understanding about uh, uh, being more outcome centric and also having a more proactive approach to, uh, to jobs than a reactive approach. I think uh, in India, traditionally, we have had a more reactive approach uh, where we have uh, the college do placements, we just have to kind of wake up, uh, put on a tie, sit for interviews, all of that. I think uh, that to a more proactive approach, kind of uh, looking for looking out for jobs and keeping yourself ready also for all of those things. I think that is one big change that I've seen. Uh, one big change that I've not seen is that, uh, uh, which a lot of people thought would happen, but has not happened, is that people still prefer campuses. Uh, there is a very small section of people who kind of uh, moved uh, uh, online and said that, okay, uh, online is a better way for me to kind of go about these things. But for a mass, uh, long tail, uh, for a large majority of, uh, when I say Bharat, or when I say Bharat, I also mean to say the large majority of other emerging countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, large parts of Africa, they still wanted campus experience. They want to be at a campus. They want to essentially be in a classroom. They want to talk to the professor after the class finishes out. Uh, they want to do those part-time jobs. And I think that is something that uh, uh, in 2020, when we uh, launched a lot of these online programs, uh, uh, through leverage Adu for a lot of these universities, about 100 plus universities. That was an absolutely damn show. And as soon as kind of uh, those visas started picking up in, the flight started and we started, okay, bang, this is 300% up uh, back again. So I think that is something that we also realized and we witnessed that uh, people do not care as much about uh, uh, just sitting in front of a screen and uh, uh, learning a lecture. I think that can happen on YouTube and a lot of other platforms as well. 
but a select set of people who want to kind of go to college uh, they look at both of those things in campus experience and then they essentially of course want to have a more reactive approach uh, to jobs and a more uh, uh, a more clear understanding that what i really want out of college and that outcome based uh, uh, counseling should be given to me on day one so that i can take a better decision so and do you think that uh, i mean given what you just said uh, that people mm. want to students want to go back to campuses mm. do you think that the future of higher education is hybrid of course of course so i think it's a mix of both online and offline even these people who have essentially uh, gone abroad uh, they still have a couple of classes which happen online so i think it's largely 20 25 online and 75 offline and there's a very clear understanding on what can be offline and what can be online for example if a Uh, assistant teacher is essentially coming in and solving doubts for you that can be online you can essentially do it in your room you can do it in your library you can essentially do it in a remote way setting out of your home country but if it's a classroom experience where uh, there's a lot of practical uh, teaching happening uh, where you would require essentially uh, to spend time with the uh, i would say focus groups uh, you would essentially spend time on multiple projects uh, where it is more experiential learning in some sense i think there you would need an offline experience and that would always and always and always trump uh something which is online also i'll kind of just add to that uh, uh learning is one part of it the other part also is that uh, like i said what am i really kind of going to get out of it so if i am going to that country and if i really want a job if i want to move to uk if i want to move to australia if i want to move to the us or canada i want to do a couple of those part time jobs or internships or kind of assimilate myself into that economy talk to people uh, local people in that country in that city all of those things as well and hence it makes more sense for me to be on campus to be to be doing other things as well not just a learning part i think that is how we have essentially at least witnessed uh, things move in the last two years sure thanks akshay i'm going to come back to you in the meantime i'm sure. going to hari uh, so uh, hari welcome um, um, to the education innovation summit today um, so you know at great learning today when the focus is moving from higher education particularly from your perspective at great learning uh, when the focus is moving from higher learning to lifelong learning you know um, the idea is to really be students everybody needs to be a student at every point of time so you know uh, what are the trends that you have noticed particularly when um, with the demographics of the student enrollment that you are seeing uh, at great learning um, and you know particularly with the collaboration models that you have with universities for executive programs um, so do you see them being more hybrid or do you seeing them being more online going forward Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Ritu, and and the team for uh, inviting me for to this panel discussion. And it's good to see a lot of uh, known faces and friends from the sector. Um, so big hello, shout out to all of you there. I haven't seen you guys for a couple of years. Otherwise, otherwise you would see each other on conferences like these. Um, but I hope you all are doing well. Um, coming back to your question, um, uh, Ritu. So broadly, the question is two parts, right? One is in terms of the trends. Um, uh, learning and if we juxtapose that with demographics and the second part is uh, what is the future when it comes to executive and lifelong learning is it online or is it hybrid and so on so let's let me take the first part so um you know we've now at great learning we've been in in this field of lifelong learning and executive education for more than 8 years um and of course uh, you know the advent of covid accelerated the curve uh, in terms of interest that we saw from the market in terms of uh, you know people wanting to learn the demographic change that we saw was that you know pre covid mostly um most of our learners used to be in the 25 to 35 year age bracket uh, that's where we would get most of our learners for our various programs um but over the last two years we have seen that while that segment has grown but we have also seen a lot of adoption in the other two segments which is let's say 22 to 25 which is you know what we call as early career professionals people who are in their let's say just into their first job or in their early years of their first job uh, and even people with more than let's say 15 years of experience uh, of course their learning requirements are very different the kind of programs that they are looking for the kind of learning outcomes that they want are all very different but there is adoption right so what has really happened here in the last two years is that everyone today or most of the knowledge professionals most of the working professionals uh realize that you know this this journey this career journey that they are on is a continuous journey where they have to they have to continuously upgrade their skills right so there is no there is no stoppage to learn right the skills that you have today uh you know may become less relevant or definitely will become less relevant in let's say four or five years and you will have to go back and supplement those skills and acquire either adjacent skills or higher order skills and so on so it's a continuous journey and more and more 
uh, you know, more and more professionals realize that. And that's why they are coming back to, uh, you know, options like great learning and, and everyone else uh, looking to see what else should they be learning. Right. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, in this journey of this, what is also very clear is that as they gain more and more experience in the industry, the learning outcomes that they're looking for are very different. And let me just you know, quickly kind of uh, give an example for that. So what happens is that when somebody is early in their career, like an early career professional, right, their first and foremost objective is getting a better job. Right, that they, they are looking to switch their job or switch their career, right? So everything that they want to learn is from that perspective that, okay, if I do this, if I do this program, if I acquire this skill set, will I get a different job? Will I, you know, will I be more employable and so on, right? But as you gain more experience in the industry with, you know, let's say 10 years plus of experience and so on, those learners, when they come to us, what we realize is that their, uh, their primary motivation is not about a new job. It is about how can they be better at their current job, right? They see all of these opportunities within their organizations where, uh, you know, there are new projects getting implemented or new teams getting built. So there are these opportunities for them to grow, take more leadership roles. Uh, but for that, they need to be more skilled. And, and that is that is their perspective. So obviously, what you learn and how you learn and the skills that you develop also change. And, and that's the basis with which we also create programs. So the 50 plus programs that we have in different universities, you know, each of those cater to a different learning outcome, a different learning objective and primarily catering to a different audience, uh, you know, depending upon what they're looking for. Uh, to your uh, second question or the second part of your question, Ritu, about uh, in, in, this, in this area of lifelong learning and executive education, uh, is the future online or hybrid? Uh, see here, you know, unlike, unlike full-time education, here the challenge is that time is always a constraint amongst all other constraints that working professionals have. Right. So they have to take out time to study or to learn in, um, you know, in conjunction with the time that they have to take out for their professional and personal lives. Right. So that is where online kind of trumps over. Uh, so which is why we are seeing a massive adoption. I believe we will continue to see an adoption when it comes to online learning. Um, having said that, there is always an audience and especially senior professionals who do value, uh, you know, classroom learning as well. So. You know, post COVID in, in, you know, what we really foresee is that, of course, most of the market would be going online, but there will be that niche segment, a premium segment that would want to learn, uh, you know, in a classroom environment, but limited exposure, which means like maybe 25% or 30% of the learning happens in classroom over weekends and rest happens online. And there will be an audience uh, that would value, value that kind of learning as well. Sure. Thanks a lot, Hari. I'm going to come back to you again. Um, I'm going to come to Ashutosh now. Um, Ashutosh, at Testbook, uh, you know, uh, you focused always more on government jobs. Um, and they have always been, I would say, in one sense, very highly sought after in India. But I think uh, since 2014, when uh, Testbook was incepted to now, what kind of change have you seen uh, in terms of people's outlook for taking government jobs? I mean, given the fact that there's so much happening in the economy at the same time. Um, so do you think that overall, um, with the government's uh, notion towards privatization and, you know, they're um, taking a big steps towards it, and, you know, they're looking at a lot of temp positions rather than more permanent positions in, in the larger state protocols. Um, do you feel that there is some change that is happening on the government job side, which are trends that you observed? Uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ritu and the entrepreneur team, uh, India team for having me here. <clears throat> so, Ritu, uh, uh, I guess uh, there is a, uh, uh, like say, the reverse side of a thing which is happening in India. So, when the pandemic happened, <clears throat> And then there was a lot of uh, uh, job cutting was happening in different, different organizations. We will got more awareness, more aware about the government job opportunities. Because if you look at uh, on an average, uh, people take three to four years to crack a government job. Even if they just have to pass the aptitude test. The question is, why take three, four years to sort of crack the government job? It's finally because of the way a huge competition. There are more than 50 million students uh, fighting for a merely five lakh to six lakh jobs, right? But, but the biggest... Uh, uh, biggest motivation or intent for, for the users there is the job security. So they know that if they are able to crack a government job for the next 30, 35 years, no, no one is going to throw them out uh, from that particular organization. And that, that you cannot take it off. Even though the privatization is happening, but still there are a lot of, lot of opportunities which exist in the market, uh, which exist in the different, different organizations. And every year, a lot, a lot of election movement is uh, happening in India. A lot of new vacations are coming up. 
So we have not seen such trend. People getting skeptical about the government job when they're getting more, more like say the mainstream towards the government job, uh, because the COVID has something where uh, uh, they have been able to see how uh, like say that the government or the private companies have reacted over. So we know that in the COVID days, uh, almost two years, people were fired, people jobless, but people uh, who were working in the government job, they were sitting at home, they were sort of getting the salaries, and they were able to sort of manage their entire family and everything. So, so that piece is not there. But definitely from a user perspective, in this COVID era, there has been a huge, uh, you can say, uh, a, a shift in the behavioral change in terms of online versus offline. So when we started, Ritu, I remember that, that time when we used to talk about that, you know, replace the offline coaching, so people used to laugh at us. And then that was not possible. And then and, and from the user perspective, that the main behavior that we were able to see that they, they want just the assessment piece on online, that's it, because the exam had moved online. But when the when the geo came, when the uh, smartphone became cheaper, and during the COVID day, when they were able to sort of see that they're now able to access a good top quality teacher sitting at their home, at least one fifth of the price. That's where, like, say, and then in terms of outcome, uh, the platform like Tesco were able to sort of prove that, like, say, even if, like, say, you are going through online programming, like, so four to five months, uh, four to five months of the program, your score has been improving by, like, say, forty percent, fifty percent. That's a very clear, uh, clear number shift happening and seeing in the in the dashboard. So I guess those are the things which actually build a strong trust uh, among those users uh, around the online product and the services which is available. But 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 uh, uh, even if uh, uh, there is a huge things have got a lot of things happening from uh, privatization etc. But we have not uh, seen any such uh, 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 like say the scaredness or something uh, uh, from the or, or let's say among the users so far. Sure, I think the the love of government jobs in India is so high that the market would never probably uh, change too much. Um, thank you, Ashutosh. I'm going to switch to Akshay now. So Akshay, uh, I know at Hero Wired you're doing some great work in terms of uh, helping the tech talent needs to get developed, and you know particularly in in current situation when digitization is the order of the day, that we are so short of tech talent in this country. Um, that everybody is feeling the heat, not just the tech company, but everybody who is also looking for some kind of digital transformation to happen in their organizations. So, you know, uh, how are you looking to close the gap? Um, so from a, that perspective, are you working with as, uh, NASCOM or some other bodies to see how this gap could be closed? And also, you know, any kind of hybrid initiatives or virtual only initiatives that you're taking to see that this uh, uh, gap is closed faster for India? Sure, Ritu. Uh, great question. Thanks for having me on the panel. Let me uh, give a perspective on where the skill gap is coming from. I've been on both sides. You know, I've run a uh, university as well running now Hero Wired. If you look at India as a country, there's a huge employability paradox. As per government's own reports, anywhere between 70 to 75% of engineers are unemployable. There was a survey which Fiki and McKenzie did a couple of years ago, which pegged the number way higher. They were talking about upwards of 90%. So on one hand, you have a problem in the engineering institution. Now I'll talk about engineering largely because that's a large um, uh, recruiter for companies. So there's, strong, uh, there's a huge problem on the engineering side. At the same time, um, you look at uh, demand huge demand for tech talent. Most companies, whether new age, old age, manufacturing services, are unable to fill the tech demand. Now, <clears throat> we need to break the employability paradox. Otherwise, what's going to happen is we'll continue having graduates come out for not getting commensurate jobs. And what Hero Wide is really trying to do is, how do you be a bridge between the two? How do you address the problem at its root. Once people graduate, they join companies, yeah, you still need to train them, upskill them. That's a continuous learning process. There's something which Hari also mentioned about. Demand in industry is changing so quickly that people in companies also need continuous learning. At the same time, by working in colleges, universities, we are trying to train people while, even before they graduate. So that at least the input which comes into uh, the corporate world is far more suited. And um, if you look at global data, while well, India, if you talk the government figure, which I shared, 70, 75% of people are unemployable. The moment you take the figure from China or US or Thailand, there's a huge difference. There they talk about sub 20, 25% 
of people of engineering being unemployable so what is really happening is now it's a very complex problem to solve because i also run a university it's not that colleges or universities don't know what is happening most colleges universities know that here are the skills we need to train our learners on but there are challenges to that i don't know if you're aware ugc last year came out with a new ruling that for universities we can only hire phds to teach earlier we could hire non phds but we could not promote them they had to remain uh, assistant professor one ap one throughout the journey now you can't even recruit non phds so if i have to train somebody in some of the new new age skills you know talk about ai ml data science you know blockchain crypto india doesn't produce enough phds in these areas all of these areas phds were not offered in this area till about 15 10 15 years ago so where where do education institutes find talent to train in such areas so that's a genuine problem there on the education institute side there is shortage of talent especially in these areas which i spoke about you are competing with industry you know if you have somebody who's done a phd in ai ml would they work for a education institute or would they work for one of the big tech big tech firms so you have a challenge there of lack of trained manpower secondly education institutions the way they run it takes time to introduce anything new so that is really what hero wide is trying to do we are trying to take some of our programs offer them in colleges universities so that by the time the learner graduates he or she is adequately trained for what the industry wants sure uh, thanks in fact you know we have a question also on the same lines that do you do you think that indian state owned universities are really equipped for hybrid edtech cap capabilities um, you know particularly with the professors being uh, recruited some in some other era how do you think they're sort of going to be part of the time machine <laughs> that's actually i think point. it's a great question but most uh, institution didn't have a choice you were really forced into it you were whether you were a state university or you were a private university or a college or a school there was no choice so what most universities did was they ran boot camp for their faculty how do you familiarize yourself with zoom or google meet or some of the learning platforms so most state universities also have gone through that now is that a preferred mode of teaching is a different question altogether if i am a traditional teacher i am used to walking in the class looking at the learners writing on the board here people have you know learners are all over the country they could have bad internet connection don't have access to you know good laptop or a desktop so there are far more challenges than just saying that our faculty equipped so it's a problem on both sides i totally agree with you um, but i'm going to come back to you as more questions are popping in uh, but i'm going to jump to falgun and falgun we've been seeing upgrade almost all the time on tv so great work and you know i think keep up the good word out there um, but you know overall what are you seeing the change what are kind of changes are you really seeing in the higher education uh, sector with the advent of online education what kind of roi in online education is something that students look for um, when they opt for a hybrid or an online degree and you know one area i feel uh, that that might become the contention of future is the price wars that is likely to start once we are really out of the pandemic zone at least to some extent you know um, do you think uh, how do you think that the online degrees are going to be at par um, in terms of pricing with the what the uh, the price that is going to be charged by universities or even ivy league colleges and you know how how are that parity is going to come forward uh, um, in the times to come hey thanks it do a pleasure to be here and hi to the rest of the panel nice seeing you all again uh, uh to start off i think there are multiple elements uh, in the question that you asked so i will start with uh, what are the changes that we expect to see and what are the trends that uh, we are seeing right uh, the first is obviously everybody talked about uh, hybrid learning in some form or another 
and even as just Akshay uh, mentioned, I think all universities have started to embark on that journey because they were forced to. Uh, we thought that, look, it is going to happen over a 10 year horizon where universities will do start doing online and hybrid, but COVID has accelerated that process. And I think universities have been forced to do it. Students have been forced to do it. Parents have been forced to accept it. And I think we have seen massive strides in that. And I think that will continue. Uh, while I think a binary outcome of fully online or fully offline is going to be a certain set of uh, students, hybrid is going to serve the purpose in some form or way for a much larger set of students. And that's where we are working very closely with universities to see how we can help them accelerate this hybrid journey in order to deliver strong outcomes for students so that the experience is not compromised. Outcomes both in terms of learning outcomes and in terms of career outcomes for students. Uh, so that I think is going to be a massive trend for the next couple of years where we all work with uh, established universities to see how we can uh, create an ecosystem and infrastructure which is extremely strong in the hybrid space to deliver the same kind of experience and outcomes. The second key trend that we see is uh, global. Right? I think education uh, for the longest time has been a cottage industry with local uh, universities having local catchments. And uh, while that is still true, but I think we see that changing massively, uh, especially while we work with multiple Indian universities, we're trying to see how we can get them into very interesting markets like Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, Africa, Middle East, where our universities can start building acceptance and credibility. And similarly, the other way around, where I spent almost three months in the US in 2021, uh, and a month in UK. And I see that a lot of these international universities have now started to focus on the opportunity of international markets, not just for attracting students on campus, but also delivering online and creating an impact in these markets. So you will see a lot of global universities with very strong supply of uh, strong value propositions and programs with aggressive pricing in markets like India, Southeast Asia, Africa, et cetera. And that I think uh, goes, both, goes both ways. Indian universities have the opportunity to go global and global universities will come to India and some of these other markets. And I think that competition will play itself out and it's going to be exciting for all of us. Uh, now, finally, on your point of uh, price wars, I personally do not believe uh, that there are going to be any price wars. I, I personally believe that in education, uh, especially in higher education, the single most important thing is, uh, as I said, the outcomes that you can deliver to, to, to students, both learning outcomes and career outcomes. And in the long run, if you're able to do that consistently, the university or one of us, I think, is going to establish ourselves as a strong signal uh, for the student to communicate to a potential employer, to communicate to society, to, look, to say that, look, I am great at what I do. If I've done something in data science from this university or this particular partner, you can take it for granted almost that I'm a great data scientist, right? So uh, that kind of signal and that kind of consistent delivery of outcomes is going to be very important for all of us. And that's where all of us are putting in a lot of work. Uh, and in education, as I said, more than price, it's always about ROI. So when we launched the first program at Upgrad seven years back, we launched a, a PG program uh, in data science with IIIT Bangalore, it was fully online nine months and it was priced at two lakhs and this was 2015. every single person i spoke to said you're out of your mind because nobody is going to pay two lakh for an online program uh but that has changed we have over time over the last seven years i think increased the price of the program to uh, three three and a half lakh now and it has consistently been only a function of the value we are able to deliver to the student uh, if you're not able to do that then obviously there will be pricing issues and all of that but even at that point of time, and even today, what I tell my team is that if somebody is telling you that, look, this program is too expensive for me, but if that same student today gets an admission letter from an IIT asking him to pay 20 lakhs or from a Harvard asking him to pay two crores, they will pay it without blinking an eye. But they think three lakh upgrade program is expensive, which just means that we are, they think that we are not delivering the value or there is no ROI in this, and that is work for us to do. So as long as all of us are able to focus on delivering that value and ROI, I don't think is going to, at least for me, I hope it doesn't go into a place where it becomes all about pricing. I hope it goes into a place where it becomes all about uh, the value that we're able to add and the ROI we're able to deliver for students. Sure, you're right, absolutely. And I think probably, you know, um, the online campus recruitment would also probably play a very big role in times to come and, you know, the kind of, uh, and I mean, for what's always worked big for uh, campuses to get established over these long 
uh, journey of years is that you know what kind of uh, recruitment and what kind of package was offered to a student uh, who was coming out of there and i think eventually we will see that in the online um, campuses as well um, you know as we go ahead um, i'm going to come to you kashyap um, so you obviously have a, a global presence at simply learn and you know uh, so you know if you have to look you've obviously been observing startups both not just in india but also um, uh, outside india particularly edtech has been a revolution that is happening globally so you know what what are the learnings that you have taken from global edtech startups and what changes are happening in that part in different parts of the world which i think indians can learn from and i'd also like to ask you a financial question which i've refrained myself from now though i should be asking in to this panel is do you think i mean you know we've seen so many ipos happening all over the place for startups do you think edtech also needs to step forward and start doing ipos and if it at all it's a good idea to do ipos outside india maybe in the new york stock exchange or some other part of the world thanks atu uh, it's great to be part of this panel uh, Uh, and a great group to brainstorm and discuss with so so it's really good being here uh, i i think uh, let me take the question in two parts i'll answer the question on ipo uh, first and then maybe get to what are the observations on the international market hey, my my feeling is more than that ipo is a matter of time i think a lot of companies on this panel itself are all thinking about it and uh, you know planning for it uh, in fact if i think back you know two three years back uh, i and a few friends we used to have lot of discussion that there are there is so much of private equity funding on the consumer internet side in general why are none of those companies listing and lot of it was to do with the listing rules in india uh, the requirements that a company needs to meet to basically list on the public markets uh, but i think lot of that is changing and we've started seeing the huge spread of listings with nike paytm and zomato and so on and i i think this is this i, I don't see this stopping so it's a great trend for the country uh, and i definitely see that the edtech sector will uh, you know join the trend it's a matter of time so maybe like three to four years hopefully there should be multiple ipos whether in the indian stock exchange or nasdaq i think that time will tell so that that's more a financial decision for most companies to figure out um i i think uh, coming back to the uh, first question um, globally what are the trends that we see on the edtech side um there are i would say two major trends and i i, I would basically make these observations in in two buckets one is the uh, skilling space that professionals looking to acquire certain skill sets and what exactly are they looking for and what's driving the market um and, and the second one is more on slightly more on the higher ed and university side that what are the trends that uh, we are noticing uh, one on the skilling side i think uh, you know historically one of the things that has happened is more the side people once they do their graduation or post graduation and join a particular career track uh, there is a tendency to not switch over too much because there is the entire thought process of sunk cost saying that i've spent 5 years in a particular area if i am in sales then i've done sales and if i move to some other uh, profession or some other role then i will not get credit for my experience but one of the things that the entire uh, you know the the access to information is driving is more the side people are very very aware on what are the trends in the market uh, so if there are certain skill sets which are in huge demand if they are seeing salary differentials they are getting to see that you know if let's say two people started with uh, a, you know a similar salary package and seven years down the line depending on the domain which is doing much better is there is a huge differential that starts forming people are actually lot more open to actually taking things in their own hands building the skill set that is needed and switching careers so we see that as a huge trend globally that basically people are very clear saying that what do i want to do for the next 10 years i might have done something for the last 5 years that's fine if i am doing really well and if i got a great path in front of me then i'll continue doing that but we see huge demand on the skilling side with people looking to acquire skill sets that are going to accelerate the next next phase of their journey so automatically it drives more and more uh, research around digital skilling new age tech uh, areas like blockchain ai machine learning and and so on uh, and, and that's one huge trend which is only accelerating so i think that's uh, that's one thing that we are noticing um, speeding up the second thing is uh, again i think a uh, lot of people spoke on the panel about outcomes we see 
very very strong focus on outcomes people are not looking at learning for the sake of it when it comes to a new skill set uh, and therefore uh, they are looking for programs that can actually deliver learning and career outcomes and they are ready to pay a premium for it so one of the big changes that we've seen over the last 5 7 years is that probably if i were to think about 2013 14 15 time frame um, people would be more uh, focused on looking for e learning programs where they can learn on their own look at a few videos uh, dabble in a little bit of stuff thought process is still that if i'm in a job then my company should train me right uh, but now if i look at last 3 years there is a very clear focus that i need to take charge of my career growth if there is a skill set that can make a difference uh, let me look at a program that really delivers value what what can give me hands on knowledge what can give me the right certification the right degree uh, or, or or the right kind of experience which then i can translate into career growth effectively so a lot of people are looking at education more as an investment increasingly more as an investment rather than as a cost and and that's making a huge difference in the direction in which the market is heading so i think these are couple of tre- trends which are playing out and and most companies are trying to adjust their portfolio of products uh, to tap into what the consumer is looking for um on the higher ed side and on the university side one of the very strong trends that i see is that with the advent of technology edtech online learning blended learning whichever model you talk about it is translating into a you know a, a leader uh, takes a larger share of the market kind of a, a direction so so for example uh, earlier the entire thought process was more this that if i'm staying in a particular place i would have maybe five seven universities in that catchment which i'm considering and i'll probably enroll for one of them however increasingly the question that students are asking themselves is that if i can do an online program or a blended program with the best university out there why would i settle for whatever is closest to my hometown or my home right and and that's driving this entire trend that earlier capacity was a huge constraint let's say an iit would be able to take in 500 people and and that's it so if you don't make it it's over but with the entire online route um, even if you don't get into the primary program by a premium institution you can get into some of their online programs some of their certificate programs and stuff like that and a lot of people actually carry a lot of weightage for that that i would rather do that rather than go into a tier 3 college and basically do a program from from there so we definitely see this also being a trend towards greater consolidation and stronger brands winning in the market um, compared to a broadly geographic spread of horizontal edtech institutions so i think that's one very strong trend that we see globally not just in india us oh, but in sure. most uh, parts of the world so sure. uh, i'm so sorry to cut you in but we're really extending on time and uh, we have a section of words which we have to do uh, before our next speaker professor anil joins us uh, he's already in the back end so i i'd really uh, request all our eminent panelists to please stick around for a couple more minutes i know you all have a, a heavy schedule ahead of all of you but just a couple of minutes to encourage all our winners so just allow us a minute while we get the preset done uh, miss mara we're just going to get the preset done for this uh, section and let's roll it uh, could we have the preset please of uh, our next set of awards being displayed so ladies and gentlemen the best uh, test prep solution of the year and that goes to test uh, book uh, congratulations could i request uh, ashutosh kumar ceo and founder to kindly join us Hey, hi everyone, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Santosh for India team, all the jury members. And as all, 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 all like the earlier award was saying, like it's uh, always a validation and pleasure to uh, sort of receive those awards. And uh, each and everyone in the team puts a lot of hard work, hard work, day and night. They don't care about it. And 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 uh, so last one year we got almost like so 95, 96 lakhs new students coming on the platform. And and then the kind of impact that we were able to create is super massive. And very focused on the tier two, tier three, tier four audience. that's where the craze of the government job is actually and and the it was asking right so are there is a shift there's no shift at all and that's one of the validation so thank you everyone uh, thank, thanks a lot and thanks to my uh, 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 thanks to our students as well absolutely ashutosh congratulations well with this uh, let's go on to the next preset please well the ed tech startup of the year and that goes to upgrade well congratulations to the entire team uh, well we did have our speaker uh, falgon who had joined us so congratulations to falgon and the team uh, well let's move on and find out the next uh, winner please 
the best skill solution platform and that goes to simply learn uh, could i request kashyap dalal ceo and cbo of simply learn to kindly join us kashyap thanks over to sure. you uh, thanks ritu babna and team i think it's a pleasure to uh, get this award and again validation of uh, some of the work we are doing i, I think personally one of the things that i'm super passionate about is more the stage of india's growth journey i think uh, india will need 10 20 million people skilled in programming and data and digital skills in general over the next 5 7 years and uh, really super excited to play a part in making sure that that talent is ready for the economy absolutely thank you and congratulations with this the last two awards in this preset could we have them please well the best online personalized uh, learning program that that goes to hero wired congratulations to the entire team and could we request akshay munjal ceo and founder to kindly join us akshay perfect thank you so much extremely humbled to receive the award for a young company like ours it means a lot the team has worked tremendously hard over the last 2 years to get us here and we feel very fortunate and blessed to be a part of this mission to help improve overall the quality of the indian education thank you right congratulations and with this the final award in this preset please well the best online uh, skills provider of the year and that goes to great learning congratulations to the team of great learning by well, requesting hari krishna nair co-founder to kindly join us Hi, hi. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for this uh, recognition. Uh, absolutely humbled and thrilled to receive it. I think uh, the credit really belongs to the entire team, the faculty, and all the students, um, all the learners who believed in us. Uh, just as a closing thought, I think you know the opportunity and challenge ahead of not just Great Learning, but all the companies on this panel and the companies in the panel before, is so immense that I am very confident that um, you know everybody here has a role to play. in changing how education becomes more impactful and more transformative in the years to come and i think that is that is truly the exciting part about this journey thank you right. thanks again thank you and congratulations ms ms mara your words of congratulations to all the winners before we move to the next section please i think uh, thank you bhavna and i think uh, sitting over here we probably have the uh, the future the educator providers i remember there was a time when we used to celebrate our universities and i think it's just a matter of time maybe an year or so when we will equally so celebrate our edtech companies also for the kind of uh, education that they are delivering to students and as an outcome of that education that they are receiving uh, from the edtech companies they are able to go out and find their place in the job market so i think congratulations to all the winners and to all of you for uh, doing this wonderful work and i think you are the future universities of india uh, in terms of the delivery of education that you are doing um, you know for some of you who can stay back we have uh, professor anil sahastrabuddhi from aicte who is going to be speaking next and i know there's just been a new order from aicte that they are planning to detach edtech startups from the higher edtech space um with universities um as the new order so you know it would be really great to question him about it and to know more about it but thank you very much for joining us today i just had an amazing time with all of you and learning from all of you thank you very much absolutely thank you and with this so we really like to thank all our panelists and for much thank you to thank you thank you bye So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is now time. We're a little uh, extended on time, but we'll try and cover up uh, on the billion-dollar question: Are the rising evaluations of edtech sus startups sustainable? Well, for this, we're joined by Professor Anil, uh, Chairman, All India Council of Technical Education. Well, Professor Anil has held uh, several important academic, research, and administrative positions at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Tata Consulting Engineers. Northeast Regional Institute of Science and Technology, Itnagar, and IIT Guwahati. He served as a director, College of Engineering, Pune, since 2006 on a deputation from IIT Guwahati prior to joining as AICT uh, chairman. Well, with this, I'd really like to uh, welcome on the stage and screen Professor Anil D uh, to join us. Thank you, Professor Anil. Over to you. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So, may I speak now? Yes, please. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for this particular keynote, which I am asked to be addressing, especially the billion-dollar question: Are the rising valuations of it to companies, startups, sustainable? 
I think they have proved their worth. They have already been uh, valued as billion dollars once, and many more will come. And the very fact that uh, five of them were awarded just now, whether it is textbook, upgrade, simply learn, hero wired, and great learning, uh, they are all part of our uh, initiative of what is known as NEET, National Educational Alliance for Technology, where AI-based learning of various subjects have been incorporated by AICT more than two years ago, and the third version is ongoing, and many more companies will be joining the bandwagon. So the importance of tech companies, edutech companies, who are able to give skills for our students as an additional feature beyond their education is going to be very, very valuable from two perspectives. One is employability. The second one is entrepreneurability. And therefore, the value of the tech company is not going to diminish. There will be valuation. It will always have pluses and minuses and depends on how many more will join. There will be takeovers of companies by another company and so on and so forth. So valuations will continue to grow. There is no doubt about that with population of the size of 135 crore of which the young population which is interested in employability and entrepreneurship rising. And our own vision of uh, increasing the gross enrollment ratio in higher education from present level of 27% uh, to 50%, we cannot wish away the importance of the edutech companies. In the beginning, you also said that AICT and UGC have got a new notification which came up and we need to discern between what has been stated and what is going to be allowed and not allowed. The universities are the ones who are entitled to offer programs which lead to degrees and diplomas, postgraduate degrees and postgraduate diplomas. They are all approved by a process of regulation, be it by UGC or by AICT. And in the new national education policy, when a single regulatory body comes up called as Higher Education Commission of India, one of the verticals will be National Higher Education Regulatory Council, which will continue to do the task of what the AICT or UGC is doing. So there will be regulation which will be in place and institutions or universities who are going to be set up, new ones or the existing ones, will continue to be regulated by some kind of a regulatory mechanism. However, the institutions like startup companies, if they also form what is known as Section 8 companies and then apply them for giving education, maybe PGDM program, MBA, MCA, they are most welcome. But if it is a profit-making company, formally today education sector does not allow profit entity to give formal degrees. But certification programs, they are most welcome. Add-on programs, most welcome. In fact, the whole idea of the NEET portal, which AICT and Ministry of Education developed, was for this very purpose. Education, education which is imported from the colleges and universities will create citizens of tomorrow with a background which will be helpful in their lifetime but when it comes to employability at times, yes. what is relevant to the industry at the current point in time is not taken care of. And that is why there is a value addition which happens through such kind of skilling programs. It is not just when they are in the colleges and universities, but even post their graduation, when they are employed, if they are doing a particular type of a job because of the change in technology, which often comes in, and today we talk about emerging technologies as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, machine learning, robotics, 3D printing, augmented reality, virtual reality, cloud computing, cyber security, blockchain, data science. These are all areas which are very important from... Mr. Anand, you are muted. Could be requesting you to please unmute. So sorry about that. Yes. I don't know. Someone muted me. <laughs> no worries. Uh, we'll, we'll get the team to not do that. Well, well, well. <laughs> Because someone else was speaking, that's why everyone was muted from me. <laughs> yeah, 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 so that's sorry about that. So I, I, I was uh, referring to the role of edutech companies vis-a-vis -vis the formal colleges and universities. The programs which are approved by the regulatory bodies, be it AICT and UGC, in terms of permitting a program to be run, is the responsibility of the university. The edtech companies can provide support in terms of 
technology platforms for creating content which is more interesting by using augmented reality, virtual reality, or data science in, in order to make sure that the students are learning outcomes which are going to be achieved out of the education that is being imparted. So there is a place for edutech companies for skilling. I was talking about not only skilling when students are in the universities and colleges, but also post uh, their graduation when they enter into the job market. And if they are employed by a X company, if they want to shift to a Y company, which is doing some other activity, naturally the skilling which uh, a candidate had earned during graduation and during the job of five, 10 years of experience may not be sufficient. So there is upskilling, reskilling, which is required not only when someone is shifting from one company to the other, but also within the same company because the job profile has changed. You will have more of IoT, more of AI, more of machine learning, all of that when it gets embedded in cybersecurity, cloud computing. I have told about various new emerging areas. These are all called as emerging areas, but they are no more emerging areas. They have entered the market. There may be new things which will come up, which we call in the future of learning. And in that case, unless a student, one who is lifelong learner, does not continue to learn, I don't think he will fit into the industry at all. And therefore, there is a great deal of uh, work that is required to be done, not only by universities and giving online programs, but also by ed tech companies in order to give the latest in technology that is happening in the industry world to the students or to the employees who are already working. And that's why the valuation of these companies will continue to rise. There is no doubt about it with such a huge population. And India being a software giant in some way or the other, all these ed tech companies who have been creating products which can be and which are many of them AI based, you test a student in terms of uh, the learning that he or she has already done and for learning a particular course, if there is an additional material that is required, how do you provide that for learning? And the path taken by different students in an edtech platform could be different. Someone who has a better learning, which is a pre-learning already done, may do the course uh, at a much shorter duration while someone who has much less knowledge about that course may have to do a lot of pre-learning and then come into the program. And this portal or this educational technology platform will provide an opportunity to make a student learn all that what is required as a prerequisite and then move forward, taking a little longer time than the rest of the people. So all these are very valuable things which are happening in the industry, especially edutech industry, but only thing which uh, the warning issued by both AICT and UGC is don't take the mantle of giving an MBA on your own without having an approval for doing so. And uh, going as a franchisee of a uh, existing university is also not permissible. If you want to enter the market of giving MBAs and MCAs or even whatever degrees, online degrees, you come to the regulatory process, get approved and then run it. There is no problem about that. For that, one profit entity is not allowed. Therefore, you'll have to create a Section 8 company and then have an another arm of your company. This can go on as a certification program. Certification does not require any approval. But when it comes to offering a degree, postgraduate degree or a postgraduate diploma or a diploma, there is a regulation in country and it has to be followed. That is all what we wanted to say through the circular which has been released or the advertisement which has been released. But the value of uh, <clears throat> the products of this nature can be seen from the number of companies which onboarded onto AICT and Ministry of Education portal called NEET. Itself shows there are more than now 100 products onboarded, more than 50 odd companies who have put their products online uh, onto the platform. And what we have stated here is for every four students who buy the product, you have to give one free seat which as a government body, we want uh, our sections of the society who cannot afford even that small fee of 5,000, 8,000, 3,000, 10,000, which these companies charge for individuals. Uh, we would like to get those free seats to be distributed to weaker sections of the society, be it SC, ST, OBC, or economically weaker sections of the society from the general category as well. Uh, and that is where we stand. Now, 
there are other activities where edtech companies have a great role to play different universities who are giving online program or odl program may not have a robust uh, learning management system uh, government has itself created a mooc platform called soem which has four quadrants one quadrant is for delivery of lectures in the form of video lectures the second quadrant is additional reading material provided as pdf files or additional uh, you know videos from other sources which are in the open source market and the third one is the discussion forum where uh, students can interact with each other with the faculty who is coordinating the course and the fourth uh, 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 window there is that of examination that means uh, be it uh, sessions examination or final examination or the quizzes assignments given and then evaluation of the student at the end of the program and then give the credit or grade for the students who do it something similar in the private sector also anyone can create a portal and any university may use either the swayam portal or may use some other portal which is created by an edutech company or for creating an excellent content which is very interesting if uh, some kind of uh, augmented reality virtual reality is to be made use of or a lot of animation is to be made use of and there are a lot of software which are available both uh, ones which are in the free domain that means open source as well as there are those which are from a particular company which is to be paid money for license and then do it if the edutech companies help faculty of the universities to create a content with a lot of simulation which makes the class interesting they are most welcome this is the role that edutech companies are required to play in collaboration with the universities but not give their own degrees by themselves without having the approval i th i think i have made this uh, much more clearer than what uh, people were thinking and some of the aspects of education in terms of uh, creating values the morals the integrity uh, what we talk about in the even industry world uh, we all see that they want people who work in teams they want people who manage the timelines they want people who have got the ability to be clear in their thinking in terms of critical thinking analytical ability and if to develop this if any type of certification is going to be provided by any edu company both as a part of the curriculum or outside the curriculum is welcome not the whole curriculum by itself otherwise what is the university for the university was established for giving degrees for creating the next generation of students who are ethical who are moral and if this itself is going to be defeated in the very process i think there is something which is missed out and that is what uh, i want to substantiate on this particular platform and if there are any questions from any edutech companies or from the organizers the bhavna or ritu you are most welcome to ask me the questions thank you very much uh, professor anil it's always wonderful to have you here and uh, talking to our audience and thank you very much for clarifying the uh, the circular um that you spoke about we have a few questions that have come in there is one from mahesh who says that uh, you know uh, what are the changes you would uh, see in the non technical undergraduate programs in india uh, nowadays many online degree programs are available from international universities and how indian universities can compete with those online degrees and how government can recognize these online undergraduate programs in india online uh, programs other than in some fields are already permitted by ugc and they have been offered by many universities i think about 56 of them are offering various programs in online mode where we do not have hardcore experiments or working by hands is required such programs are allowed even in some way some sort of sort of indirectly related with engineering i'm talking about for example mca Uh, computer applications program or ai and data science program are also offered in an online mode whereas uh, coming to hardcore engineering like civil engineering mechanical engineering electrical engineering where you have to work with actual equipment on the field and understand the nuances of that they are not allowed although we have a lot of uh, virtual labs today existing which give a lot of input in terms of lot of experiments simulation based experiments but ultimately in order to become a full fledged uh, engineer professional you need to work with the equipment by hand you know observe them uh, operate them uh, otherwise a pilot who has been trained only on a simulator 
will you fly on that particular aircraft? I hope so. No, no one will agree to that. Uh, unless he has some flying hours put in, no one will be allowed to have the pilot license. It is almost something similar to that. Same is the case with medical education. Unless someone has operated physically on a patient, uh, you won't uh, have a degree which is offered purely on an online basis. So same is the case with some other fields like physics or chemistry or pharmacy or architecture. But many others like, uh, you know, maybe economics, maybe management, maybe we have even sociology, etc., which can be easily offered in an online mode is being already permitted. And it is only if we have to become competitive in the world market, our faculty have to be trained. You know, that is another area which edtech companies can take. How the classes can be made interesting on an online mode. You know, that is a big challenge. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. In a classroom environment, teaching learning is different. And in an online mode, keeping your uh, attention span and then making you be present there physically as well as mentally is not an easy thing. Even in a normal classroom, forget about in an online mode. And therefore, how do we make our teachers learn the art of doing this? You know, that is where, again, there is a requirement, both from the regulator, from the facilitators, from the edutech companies, and we welcome that, actually. There are a lot of teacher training programs which we have been doing in terms of Atal Academy from AICT. Something similar we would appreciate from even the companies so that uh, our students, whoever are learning, they will be excited about learning from such uh, online platforms. So we are competing, we are doing it in a big way and that is the task which we have already undertaken. Sure, sir, we'll, uh, though we are running short of time, but I think we'll quickly take on one more question. Uh, so Saurav Sinha is asking that, you know, there is some kind of career guidance which is needed to help eager students who want to pick up the right cho choice of online courses because the plethora of them being which are uh, offered through online platforms. So, you know, anything that AICTE can do to facilitate it. See, already our uh, Swayam portal itself gives a lot of uh, ideas about what are the type of courses which will be useful to you. Similarly, the NEED platform, which I have been referring quite often in this particular uh, talk for 15 minutes, is the one where all these are tested. And please remember that uh, this is a very rigorous process through which these are onboarded onto our platform. First, a blind review is done without knowing even the name of the company and the product. It's only based on what is the outcome that is going to be achieved out of the product. Next one is whether it follows all the rules and regulations of the country in terms of laws is checked. Thirdly, the actual product is tested rigorously and the return on investment of what money is being charged, is it worth that is also seen and only then it is onboarded. So I think uh, you close your eyes and then uh, join all those courses which have been taken on board on the need portal, that itself is a possibility. Depending on what is your area of interest, you must choose the right kind of a program. Sure, sir. I'm going to now ask Bhavna to come and, you know, um, and with under your guidance, we would like to present some EdTech awards uh, going forward. So Bhavna, if you can take uh, the proceedings forward. Sure. Thank you so much, Ms. Mara, and thank you so much, Professor Anand. Well, with this, uh, as Ms. Mara rightly said, it is time for the awards. Let's get the presets rolled out and let's acknowledge the next winners. Well, as you can see on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, the most uh, breakthrough edtech uh, startup of the year goes to Stan Sunstone Edu University. Congratulations to the entire team. And may we request uh, Ashish Mujal, CEO and co-founder of Sunstone, to kindly join us. Hi, Bhavnath. Uh, thank you so much uh, for recognizing us and uh, giving this award to us. And uh, this is truly, truly dedicated to the awesome team who has put their blood and sweat uh, in reaching us where we have reached today. And uh, I'll just like to uh, reiterate what Professor Sahastar Buddha said, that this is a very large market and it's a big problem. And it's, there's a space for both edutech companies and the higher education institution and the universities. And uh, they can definitely work together. And that's what we have been trying to do work together with the universities to provide them support wherever we can. And uh, with all the uh, humility and humbleness, uh, we accept this award. Thank you so much uh, for giving us this award. Thank you and congratulations. Uh, well, with this, let's move on and find out the next uh, winner. As you can see on the screen, best learning solution, math, science, language, drama, and that goes to QMath. Well, congratulations to the entire team. And may we request Manan Kurma, founder of QMath, to kindly join us. 
Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, really thrilled to get this award uh, at QMath. We think math is not just a subject you learn in school, it's life skill, critical for every child's success today. And with QMath, we are on an ambitious mission to build the world's largest math brand and win the global math market. And I think with any such grand mission, the real key to success is a great team, uh, which is true in our case as well. So I'd love to dedicate this award to our uh, stellar team and the thousands of QMath teachers on our platform who've been working day in and out through the pandemic. Uh, to keep pushing us closer to our mission. So thanks a lot and uh, happy to get this recognition. Great. Congratulations on that. Uh, well, with this, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our next uh, award. Could we have the preset, please? Yes, the Emerging Classroom Tech Solution of the Year, and that goes to Perceive Education. Uh, congratulations to the entire team. And uh, for this, if I may request Uttam Kumar Pandey, co-founder and CEO, to kindly join us. Uh, hi, Bhavna. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to thank the jury, the Education uh, Innovation Award team, and this whole uh, effort and the dedication put by our team to come up with a solution, an XR solution, which has a future vision of uh, coming, uh, building a perceived educational verse for education uh, teachers and uh, students to work on. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Uttam, on that. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, it is time for our next preset. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the, bed, uh, the best ed tech company of the year, and that goes to Vedantu. So congratulations to the entire team of Vedantu. And uh, let's move on and find out the next uh, preset. Let's see who gets the next win. The best online uh, children's learning via preschool, and that goes to Europe. It's uh, preschool. Congratulations to the entire team out there. Uh, let's move on and find out the next winner. Uh, Emerging Egg Tech Startup of the Year, and that goes to Example. Well, congratulations to the entire team. And uh, may I request Vardhan Gandhi, co founder Example, to kindly join us. Mr. Gandhi, if you're there, would you like to join us on the screen? So I believe uh, Mr. Gandhi is not there in the back end right now. We'll see if he can join us shortly, but let's move on to the next preset, please. I, I, I can just see Mr. Gandhi joining in. Okay, Mr. Gandhi, congratulations. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you. I, I would like to thank the jury for the award. And it means a lot to us as a, as a company because uh, it, at the end of the day, these are the motivations that take us forward as a team. And we look to provide uh, as becoming the best employability solution we can be for the students. And these awards will uh, keep on motivating us. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you and congratulations. Well, with the final two awards in this set, let's roll out the next preset. The best corporate uh, training platform, and that goes to Wiley Next. Congratulations to the entire team. And may we request uh, Ritesh Kumar Country Lee to kindly join us. Hi, Bhavna. Hi. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you see me? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to uh, see you, Ritesh. Uh, Ms. Mario, are you able to see him? No, right? Um, Ritesh, is there some uh, video issue out on your end? So I think I have switched on my video. No worries, Ritesh. Uh, please go ahead. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, I think uh, words go a long distance, so please go ahead. Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone. Uh, so pleased to be receiving this award on behalf of Wiley. Uh, Wiley India expanded its footprint in India's edtech professional learning space with Wiley Next. Just two years since launch, we have certified and trained over 12,000 professionals in the APAC region in areas such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data analytics, etc. This award is a true recognition of our efforts. We will continue to shape the workforce of the future with our efforts. Thank you very much, the jury, for selecting Violinix for this award. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations on this uh, and congratulations to your entire team at Violinix. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now with this, it is time for our final award in this category. Shall we see? All right. The EdTech Deployment of the Year, Higher Ed, and that goes to Medwasity. Congratulations to the entire team. And for this award, if I may request Jaydeep, uh, Gerald Jaydeep, CEO, to kindly join us. Gerald? Thanks, Bhavna, for uh, giving us the award. And Ritu, nice to get connected. And Dr. Anil, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on AICT and the direction forward. 
I would like to accept this award on behalf of all the healthcare professionals out there who are working today to make a difference to COVID over the last 18 months and also for dealing with Omicron as we face it every single day. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Congratulations, Gerald. And uh, Professor Anil, uh, you know, you're the doctor of education. Let's put it that way. Okay. So we'd, we'd love your uh, words of congratulations to all our winners, please. Uh, we just request to do it. Yeah, please. Congratulations oh. to all the winners for these various categories. I'm sure they will put in their best efforts to create employability, skilling, oh. upskilling, reskilling of our entire workforce so that as a nation, what we talk about, new India, which is emerging, they will be effectively contributing to that. Right, absolutely. Uh, Ms. Mario, final words from you as well. I think uh, Anil sir has always been uh, uh, doing the path baking work of actually guiding the higher education industry to really go on and achieve the better echelons and what they are achieving. And thank you very much, sir, for presiding these awards and uh, actually motivating the award winners to continue to do the good work that they're doing. And I think together, you know, with your vision of um, education that you have for higher education, um, it, we should see it coming to fruition. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mario. Thank you, Prof. Anil. And congratulations to all the winners. Thank you for joining. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, it is time to move on uh, to our next panel discussion. We hope you all are having a great time. It is time for EdTech, Exit or Invest More. Factors driving the investment spree in EdTech, a very intriguing topic for this. Um, this session is going to be moderated by Mr. Saurabh Kumar, editor, Special Projects Entrepreneur India. And joining uh, Saurabh would be our panelist, Ankur Vital, co founder, Inflection uh, Point Ventures, Manish Adwani, Associate Vice President, Elevation Capital, and Rishabh Malik, Venture Partner, Changal Ventures. Well, with this, I'd like to humbly welcome, with a lot of enthusiasm, all our panelists and uh, Saurabh. No one better than you to moderate this, so please take it forth and have a great discussion. Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. Um, in India, as we know that uh, you know every household, uh, the majority chunk of their income goes into children's education, and uh, but quality education was something which was lacking, and that, that is where the edtech companies have come in. But more so importantly are the backers, the backers who are the, who provide funds to these companies to grow to the levels that they have grown, we have seen in the past two years. And we have three such backers here today. Thank you, Ankur Manish and uh, Rishabh uh, for joining us uh, today here. So, you know, I'll just continue from where we left in the last session. So, Mr. Uh, Professor uh, Anil Sahasrakade was here and he uh, talked about <coughs> the notification that came that made these uh, headlines today front page of uh, almost all newspapers so do you think that uh, in any way is going to affect uh, how edtechs have been uh, valued or have been working uh, till now uh, in no order but manish if i can start with you thanks Aurab. so sort of i think as a as, as evolution of any industry right i think regulation uh, the fact that regulation comes in, normalizes that industry is only helpful and over time it brings in more legitimacy to the sector. Uh, I think and also ensures that all stakeholders from students to even companies which are catering to these students uh, improve and come up with more effective offerings, right? So I think net net it just shows that the industry is more maturing. Uh, it shows that the, the government also is uh, bringing in regulations to formalize and also support the sector in its own way and ensure that finally students also benefit from it. So I think in the longest term, it only helps uh, ensure that there is more reg regularity that comes in this sector. And I don't think it should impact uh, valuations in any way. It just uh, ensures that uh, like companies become more formal in which in the way they cater to uh, these startups, uh, to these students. Risha, any thoughts? And also, given the fact that maybe a lot of startups actually, uh, when they pitch, maybe they say that, you know, we are providing these degrees or maybe they, they would have done till now. So do you think that that's going to change uh, your perception in any way? Yeah, um, I think I agree with, uh, you know, everything uh, Manish said. I think long term, 
the regulator getting more involved uh, in the industry is a very good sign. In some way, it uh, legitimizes the industry. Uh, I do think in the short to medium term, it causes a little bit of confusion between the founders, uh, between the investment fraternity around, you know, what the real lines of the regulation are. Uh, and, and sometimes it takes a few cycles of that for that clarity to emerge to where the benefits move from short, medium term uh, to long term. You know, I think uh, an example, a parallel example could be how we've seen, you know, regulation around e-commerce in India evolve, right? You've seen regulation come in uh, all the way from uh, regulation that impacts the investment fraternity in terms of foreign direct investment. You see regulation that's coming in on how different sellers across different e-commerce platforms uh, can and should be regulated and what they can and can't do. And similarly on the customer side. So, you know, I, I think it's very positive. I don't think it, it should change uh, that interaction between founders and investors in terms of how they pitch, how businesses are evaluated and downstream valuations. Uh, so, but yeah, it, it, it is going to take a few cycles between the private and public sector uh, before they can flesh these out to where everyone has clarity of thought around it. Okay, and do you think these cycles, how, lo how long will these cycles be? Because that really affects the companies in the meanwhile, in the, in the interim when, you know, you haven't really uh, reached to a conclusion. So regulations here and there, of, of course, they dismantle the kind of the, the growth trajectory that a, a, a company actually uh, has uh, ascent, ascertained for itself. You know, it's, it's very difficult to predict how long these cycles will be because there's an interplay between two very, very diverse uh, fraternities, right, which is the, 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 the entrepreneur and startup uh, fraternity as well as the regulator. I think it just comes down to how much the regulator wants to prioritize this and, 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 and in terms of uh, fleshing it out. I, I, I again, I think that uh, having been an entrepreneur myself in, the, in my past life, I think it should not impact the founders in terms of what they're building, how they articulate what they're building. And I think, you know, speed as an early stage company is one of your key modes. So I, I don't see this compromising uh, that speed in terms of developing products, taking them to market and scaling them. Ankur, your thoughts? Ankur, I think you did. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Saurabh, you will have to just uh, you know recap the uh, area of discussion. I, I had logged out for some reason. Uh, oh, okay. So, uh, like in the previous session, we had uh, uh, Dr. Anil Shah today from the AICTN. Uh, you know, there was a news uh, today that uh, you know AICTN UGC has asked to you know the company. So I was just uh, you know trying to gauge uh, that does it in any way change your perception? I mean, inflection. I know you have investments in then that takes two exits so that's a big uh, you know kind of a portfolio that you have so in any way does this regulation change your perception about edtech the valuations or do you think it's just uh, uh, like rishab and mani said that you know it's more of a uh, you know that the company uh, that, that the space is getting regul uh, regul uh, coming under regulatory uh, uh, framework means that it's legit getting legitimized so what do you think appreciate it uh, no i uh, i heard what manish and rishab were saying uh, i i kind of agree so basically i think that this is more of a regulatory clarification and i think it's much it's much needed very important to have the rules of the game and i think it may still go few i you know few more iterations before we actually have an idea rishab took an example of e-commerce but rishab i can tell you even e-commerce is still up for grabs you know uh, there are still a lot of gray areas where what is allowed what is not allowed and who can invest and who cannot invest um, so um, i i think uh, overall this government has a, a startup friendly approach uh, so I would be very surprised if they do something which is very, uh, you know, anti-startup. Uh, uh, and, and it's probably not even required because uh, most of these startups are only enabling and strengthening the existing uh, institutions. Uh, and to so that extent, my opinion uh, and my perspective of the edtech space in India uh, does not change. Um, what would happen is that some business models will have to modify themselves. Uh, and, and, and I think that kind of environment will be there in every sector. It's not specific to EdTech. Uh, I think some regulatory clarity will keep on coming in different spaces. Even Dream 11 may have to 
you know further modify their business model you know big unicorn businesses may have to do it amazon is still fighting on some regulatory ground elsewhere so i think that's part and parcel but i think overall as long as uh, uh, you know the theme is to uh, you know uh, strengthen the system and uh, ensure benefit to the end users because i think uh, to some extent some clarification you know it is for, it is it is actually correct to say that not not everybody should be allowed to issue a mba certificate and i think there is some merit in that uh, i don't think degree should be given for free but having said that there are so many other non edtech educational institutions which also are offering different courses um so i i i hope that the government will take a more uh, expansive view uh, across the regulations and not just focus on edtech yeah. so i think the 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 one point that the professor made was that uh the the institutions which give degrees are non profit they are not for profit so they have you know if edtech have to do that then they are, which cannot i mean these two things i do not uh, think can go hand in hand right uh true um well most of them are not for profit only on paper uh while uh, they are very profitable uh that's the but rule. pardon yes that's the rule but that's the rule. but that's the rule um and uh, you know uh, i think there is already a way around it that you don't have to give degrees and you can give diplomas uh, at the end of the day it is all about upskilling uh, of the of the uh, and maybe we, maybe as india doesn't need so many mbas maybe we need upskilling in different parts and maybe that is the kind of uh, you know uh, mod modification or pivots that edtech will have to do uh, but but i think there is enough uh, you know ways around it so i think one of them is a diploma versus a degree uh, as long as you do that you are outside those gambit but i could be wrong also uh, but even if that is not true then also uh, 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 i think you can structure it differently you can call it a training class you can call it an upskilling as long as your skills are such that they are recognized by the indian employers uh, or even global employers uh, i think it should work if you said that uh, this government is uh, back to the startups and would go i think just the irony is that the announcement came on 16th of january which was announced as the national startup day and on the same day this notification comes so yeah so let's let's move on to the core uh, topic of discussion that uh, we were supposed to have today which is uh, you know the tech space exit or invest more so manish i'll i'll, I'll like to come to you first Uh, what, do, what what is your overall reading of the space? I mean, we have seen behemoths being created in edtech and M and A is free. We have seen so much of money coming in. In fact, uh, I was looking at some numbers numbers uh, uh, in terms of investment. So India's edtech investment is almost comparable with uh, you know the US at least last year and uh, last year. So. so what do you think is is the space overheated or do you think it's just the tip of the iceberg and there is much more that can be done here so sure, so sure, sure. thanks for laying that context or so i think like if you look at what education is to india right versus what it is to the us i think there is in itself a massive difference right i think education is like even culturally socially it is one of the most important levers of social mobility right and it is like parents spend more on education for their kids than they would even spend uh, in e-commerce or in, in generally in shopping in retail outside right? so i think like in itself education is a massive cat category for india as a country and hence it's just natural that our investment in uh, education matches with what is there in the us right and i just think this is tip of the iceberg uh, so so obviously there have been large companies which have been created in k12 also we are seeing that now happening in upskilling uh, which just puts the pressure on newer companies that are coming in this space to actually come up with something very differentiated uh, but also on the other side and that that limits the kind of investments or the amount of investments that you can make in this space but also on the other side it reduces like the fact that there are larger companies reduces your risk of investment because now even if uh, there is a company that doesn't let's say become really large right there is always this possibility of m and a there is always this possibility of a larger competitor uh, leveraging them and sort of com combining a much stronger and uh, combining and creating a much stronger entity right so like as an investor i think uh, the the presence of these large incumbents pushes the bar to uh, innovate uh, for newer companies but it also lowers the risk of investment when you invest in this space 
uh, and i just think that they are, they have done a great job in pushing the uh, pushing the sort of consumers to towards acceptance of edtech and like as people now become more amenable towards learning online there is just so much opportunity that will be created right uh, also one common theme across all of the large incumbents in edtech today that have been created is that they are powered by a very strong sales force uh, and they have a very st- strong strategy of driving sales through push right uh, whereas if if i look at now the next horizon of companies that will emerge in this space will effectively disrupt this model right uh, which we've seen across multiple spaces uh, so there there is still a lot of potential there is a like today edtech would be 5 7% of our uh, edtech would be 5 7% of overall education spending in china that has reach 15 20% right uh, in mature geographies you've seen that trajectory happening so there is just so much more potential for this space okay great and you have big investments you know elevation having investments in topper and academy yellow praxis is a bigger name so i'm sure that you uh, you you're still bullish uh, uh, on the space absolutely yeah okay rishab move to you what do you think of the space is it overrated is it uh, or, or 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 you know such a huge country with so many uh, you know the the demography which is in still in the space where they need uh, guidance education to you know achieve in their life do you think we, we still have a long way to go yeah so you know i i continue to remain very very bullish and i you know i think at jungle uh, we have made uh, one investment in india in a company called leap finance which is in the higher learning space uh, we are working on two more one is uh, language related uh, which is in vietnam and the other one is a, a very early stage one within k12 in india so you know as a new uh, investor to the space when i say new i'm talking last two years uh you know we continue to remain very very bullish i think the depth uh, and you know i think the regulatory point we were discussing earlier is is testament to the same that the depth is starting to emerge in the space uh, the first wave uh of, you know of edtech uh, was companies that were helping with test prep uh, you've seen a really really big push in in k12 uh you know in, in my mind largely in two buckets one is businesses that were Uh, creating and selling content and then the other one which we've seen companies like teachment class plus etc that have provided infrastructure on the back of uh, a changing education environment i the pandemic uh, and i think we're going to see more and more verticalization going forward uh, whether that expands into uh, you know more depth in in higher learning or corporate training or then even going in the preschool space you're seeing a lot of interesting companies emerging there uh and various forms of skilling that are directly related to your uh, curriculum in school or beyond uh so you know for me i don't think this is a juncture to to think about exit the space i think it's an it's an it's a juncture to to dive in deeper and see see where that verticalization is emerging and find uh, smart entrepreneurs and products to back great so i i i i i've made notes i have three things that we will come back to which is uh once we talk about salesforce one and we talked about language and verticalization but before we go to that ankur your thoughts on the space yes yeah, i think that, yeah no I, i i definitely it's not a question of ex, you know uh exit completely uh although you know uh one of the things we are early stage investors uh and so one of the things we are doing to democratize angel investment is to create frequent exit opportunities uh but it doesn't mean we are exiting the sector or the space uh what would happen is and what has started happening is that there are certain sectors which are getting overcrowded so for example in the exam prep space um i think we already have like you know five six unicorns uh and few unicorns and you know there is a lot of so then you have to basically ask yourself that okay you know what is it that they are truly doing different because you can pick up one or two exams and you can still become number one in those one or two exams uh but then is you know then it comes to basically the you know the target market and also and these could be all high revenue generating businesses but could they become uh you know a big vc ideas is something that we evaluate on but what is different is then that uh, you know in our talks to a lot of these unicorns and vcs is that uh, a lot of these uh, targeted exam prep companies now have become good targets for the unicorns so they can just acquire them and so from our uh, 
point of view or early stage investors that could still be a great exit opportunity um so uh, but yes there are certain spaces which are getting very crowded but at the same time uh, manish rightly said uh, you know education has a very different place in india um and uh, what is now what is now happening is there are smart entrepreneurs and founders out there who are finding some small sub some sub sub, sub uh, segments and going deeper into that and building a their own niche and because the in population is so big india is a very young country um a lot of upskilling is required uh and therefore these small uh, you know sub segments are also fairly large markets uh, and from an exit point of view in the sense from our exit point of view as an investor both unicorns as well as startups uh, as well as vcs are both uh, future investors and therefore for us it still makes it for an attractive sector to look at okay so i think this answers one of the questions that i was trying to uh, ask you is that verticalization so as you said that some sectors are now overcrowded and some as so i was just looking at some data so language and casual learning still is just 1% of total uh, you know edtech offering uh, in india so do you think that now people and uh, rishab also spoke about that you know he's work, he's working with a uh, edtech in somewhere uh, which is in, in the language space so do you think uh, that is the place where uh, more people are going to uh, move towards as we speak about bharat is like what what i'm saying is that uh there is still a lot of scope of growth uh there are certain sectors where a lot of growth has already happened uh and therefore uh, for a new income you know new player coming in uh it may not be the most attractive of the opportunities uh but there are still pockets and sub uh, segments which are still uh relatively virgin uh have not been you know have not been you know uh, evolved as well as they could and it's also a natural transition right once you have got your basic education then only you start getting into languages uh right you go deeper into languages uh we have invested in a startup called multibashi which is into uh, you know languages my son is learning french and spanish from them and so on and so forth right so there is still a lot of opportunities out there so uh uh what I, and but i think still every idea will have to be treated on its merit um uh, you know it's it's a, it's a, it's it's a cliche but you know every idea will still because even in the exam prep space which is overcrowded i will not deny that you uh, we just invested in a startup uh, toppers note which is because it was just doing phenomenal business i mean the numbers were just unbelievable um uh, and uh, they they were competing with the best in the world uh at least in the country uh in the ex- uh, in the exams in which uh, they are uh, participating in so uh, i think there is still an opportunity uh for uh, you know certain areas uh, even in the crowded space as you call it uh, for startups to succeed okay. ishab i'll come to you so as uh, you know ankur said that even in crowded spaces there is opportunity uh which i'm sure is a function of the sheer number of people that this country has uh, and the other thing that you spoke about was language you're working with so do you think that's the next uh, uh, gold mine because th- th- that space has not been tapped much by the at the companies nor by these uh, you know investors yeah i think i you know i i, I wouldn't uh, uh, over, like say that it's the it's the next thing but i think there are definitely a lot of emerging opportunities there to qualify what i was saying earlier uh, you know we see a business in in southeast asia that is focusing on language learning uh, english language penetration being lower the need of the hour uh, being for more and more of the middle class and emerging middle class uh, uh, to be well versed in that we've seen a favorable trend in the chinese market in that sector with a couple of very very large businesses getting created and so you know we we felt confident uh, to move forward it's not uh, announced yet so i'm not going to go into any any other details there but i think we'll see a similar trend in india right i think ankur talked about one example uh, and you're seeing you're seeing that whole building for bharat theme uh, come uh, across some of the verticals in edtech right we've seen i think there's a company called pariksha uh, which is doing that around uh, certain types of government exams uh and and jobs that come subsequent to that uh, and you're you're going to see other verticals like that emerging in that bharat theme uh 
I think as jungle, we've looked at a few early investments in that space. We haven't, uh, in India, we haven't uh, developed the confidence to to back any yet, but we'll definitely continue to to watch it very closely because if you look at other uh, other large ed tech markets, I think that has been a significant theme. All right. Manish, your views? No, completely. I think what Ankur and Prishap said earlier, right? I think, again, lang language learning, as you rightly pointed out, is a much smaller market in India as compared to, uh, at least in terms of size today, uh, as compared to if you pick up any nation, right, which is non-English speaking, there are like unicorns and large companies that have been created. China has multiple of them, right? So, and it's not like no one has tried in India that like over the past decade, there have been multiple attempts that have been made um, and generally monetizability of the audience that they've go gone, for, gone after has been one of the challenges, which is why they haven't been able to scale up. But, you know, as the masses today becomes more amenable towards learning online, they also start and also the payment infra has been solved out, right? With UPI and micro payments kicking in with, and we've started seeing proof points in some of the other spaces whether it's gaming, real money gaming, et cetera. So I think that like monetization of this large mass will happen. Uh, and language seems to be one of the strong access through which you can monetize this audience. Uh, so that will be a, a space, but I, I don't think that that will be the only space that opens up. Right? There will be multiple okay. other. Okay. That is a possibility. All right. Uh, you know, so I think uh, there is a question uh, by Asutosh Dubey who said that would investors be interested in investing in a platform working for students of vernacular languages in India? I think uh, the answer has already been given that uh, that uh, Manish said that, you know, that space has not been tapped as much as in the other countries. So I'm sure the investors will look into uh, investing in uh, that area. Uh, the next thing that uh, uh, Manish staying with you, I'll come to you talked about Salesforce that, you know, these companies at text now have a huge sales force, which is on the ground and which is pushing uh, to, you know, generate leads and everything. But, you know, that, that brings me to the question that there is a certain section which believes that uh, there are, everything is not ethical that is happening with the sales force that is doing on the ground and without taking in, but we have seen examples, we have heard about it. So what's your view? Do you think it's been, the edtechs are being, uh, being very overtly uh, aggressive or do you think it's the pressure to scale up or do you think it's the pressure from maybe investors that, that, that leads them to such, such an action? Yeah, I can take a shot at that. So, see, I, I don't think that have the fact that most of our edtech models today are sales force led is bad, right? Actually, if you think about it, uh, like as any industry matures, uh, initially when the audience is not as amenable to learning online, you have to convince them, you have to help them understand, educate them, right? And we see that happening across industries, right? If you think about a uh, Salesforce led model, actually that's an innovation which opened up edtech in India, right? Like edtech has like for the past 20, if you look at from 2000 to 2010, edtech was always there. All of these social tailwinds are already there, but no one was ready to learn online, right? And it required that innovation of having a strong Salesforce led model, which educated the audience, convinced them pulled, and helped them buy this course, right? So I think like as the industry matures, we will move more towards a pull based model uh, over time. Uh, but the fact that many of the incumbents use a sales led model actually i think is an innovation in itself uh, what you pointed about mis-selling that happens in sales right i think that happens across the spectrum when you, whether you look at financial products whether you look at health products uh, etc right so it happens and you know the fact that regulators and as well as companies building in this space are cognizant about it uh, and are taking measures to ensure that this remains in control is important uh, uh, this will never go away because finally you haven't you have an incentive system, you will always, uh, you will always have people or miscreants who will violate it. But the focus should be in ensuring that this uh, doesn't get, that this doesn't happen as much. Uh, uh, and hopefully most of the stakeholders today will take measures to ensure that this doesn't happen. Angul, coming to you, uh, you know, Manish said that, you know, some misspelling happens everywhere, be it financial products everywhere. 
but education something you know even the poorest of poor would be shelling out maybe a life savings for their kids and everything and if that is the place where it is happening do you think you as a stakeholder would go to the uh, the head tech and tell them that hey listen we have invested in you we want returns but not at that at this cost see i think uh, you know uh, ethics should supersede everything uh, but doesn't mean that what is happening currently is unethical uh, it is aggressive selling uh maybe playing to the fomo uh but that happens in every industry in every sector uh and uh, doesn't nat- naturally make it you know unethical or anything like that uh having said that if yes there is something unethical happening then as investors we should uh you know raise our hands and stop it because you know uh in the end uh if there is something wrong then we will be held holding the downside of it also um so as investors it is our job to uh, you know make sure if anything wrong is happening uh the, the, you know the other thing is what manish also mentioned was that a lot of push was also required because uh, online education was not natural to us we uh, or and few other things like application is not natural to us we are a country of rotification you know you memorize what are the 10 things that happened in world war 1 and then you go and reproduce in your board exams and get your 90% and get your you know subject of your choice that has been the education so what you are trying to now do is bringing in more application bringing in more thought process changing the way you teach self learning through videos without a live teacher uh, and sometimes this does require a little bit of push selling to educate the customers uh, this would have happened even if corona was not there what corona has just done uh, is that it has become a tina factor right there was no alternative but to do online learning and that just you know pushed forward the adoption uh, but uh, the practices would have happened even if there was you know no pandemic uh, because a lot of these things uh, you know uh, to be honest were being delivered and that's what the push tactic was yes could could there be a over zealous salesman could there be an over zealous uh, you know person uh, you know targets of course there will be and that happens in insurance sector that happens in banking sector you know i think more indians have you know there are you know there are many people who have multiple credit cards and they should not have had those many credit cards uh, so uh, you know sort of this debate can uh, you know continue till the end of time that you know what is correct and what is not correct at the end of the day my appeal would be to all the customers that please use your best judgment Uh, just don't get caught i i tell this to my investors also don't get caught in fomo just because everybody else is investing in a deal doesn't mean you should invest in a deal do your own due diligence build your own thesis build your own comfort and then go forward because anything tomorrow can fail uh and i think that would be the same that goes to the uh, customers of these products point very well taken you know I've, i'll go to rishab uh, you know few days back uh, we were interviewing a large very large investor and he said that you know for the first time the lps came back and asked that you know hey okay you made me this much of money now give me a report in terms of how much uh, you know how many people have you actually touched have you helped so that kind of a social kind of a report card was asked so if you know if you ask the edtech companies for that kind of a social report card obviously they will have good to say uh, because they have touched so many students but these small little uh, small little incidences i think uh, somehow makes a person skeptical do you do you think so vishal look i think it's a it's a fair point to um, when you read some of the things that come up in the media uh, and you hear some about some you know negativity around some of these practices it's a very very fair ask from the investment fraternity uh, to sort of sometimes even second guess second guess this but uh, you know i i would in general agree with uh, you know what what my colleagues manish and ankur said here uh you know feed on street aggressive selling uh, this is not the first industry where we've seen this number one uh as you know it, it, we've already talked about some segments within edtech becoming fairly competitive right so as a founder uh, or a team of founders uh you know getting getting your products and services top of mind getting them to market uh, being aggressive in selling is 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 in some way the need of the hour again uh, uh anything unethical should just be a no go 
but you know it's not as black and white as that right we've seen that in other industries financial services being a good example uh, and and i think from an investor fraternity uh, asking the question is important uh, but you know it's our job uh, as fund managers uh, to 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 you know develop our own thesis and conviction behind a product uh, behind uh, you know the selling approach as well as the team and do our homework thoroughly before sort of going in uh, so you know it's a, it's it's not a it's not black and white here uh, it, it, and it is going to evolve i think manish made a good point in the beginning of the conversation where he talked about a push based approach eventually moving towards pull based and i think we are starting to see early early signs of that and i think once uh, once that balance uh, uh, sort of increases between push and pull uh, hopefully some of this some of this noise and chatter will go away as well and also i think it, as time passes and we see uh, the real effect of these uh, edtech ed tech offerings on the students who are currently undergoing when they move forward in their lives maybe that would be a good validation uh, you know for for everyone to understand i believe yeah okay, okay. so you know uh, uh, so just one last question to everyone and then i'll hand it over to bhavna and i'll request uh, manish ankur and rishabh to stay back for the awards as well so uh, the budget is uh, right uh, uh, you know is coming up and so what would be your expectations from uh, the government in terms of you know uh, facilitating uh, growth of edtech obviously we have seen one notification yesterday let's not talk about it but what more can we see uh, manish if i can start with you so sort of, i think i think largely you know the motive of uh, I, i think what we've seen is that online education has become a part and parcel of sectors across of education now across the board right uh but and i see a lot of cooperation between edtechs and uh universities that ha- happens in higher ed right but yet to see a lot of that play out in the school uh system right and every other edtech entrepreneur that we meet today uh tells us that uh selling to schools is hard right uh because of multiple issues between stakeholder prioritization and aims and also maybe some government backing at the back right so like if there are if there are measures taken which also help in regularizing and also improving cooperation between uh, to to incorporate edtech into schools right i think that will be a massive uh, win for the entire ecosystem uh, but but that's the only thought i had at a high level okay uh, ankur anything from you especially given that the education budget has not been uh, too attractive for the for for the past 2 3 budgets as we have seen i don't expect it to be any different uh, i think this is a election year um i think a lot of focus would be on the states going in for elections uh and so i would expect a lot of uh, spend uh, also going there uh in the sectors which matter um i'm not saying edtech doesn't matter but i think edtech has grown significantly without any overly support and i think uh, that is the power of b2c where it's need based um i think people recognize the need uh and there are startups which are fulfilling that those needs uh and i think that is a strong enough driver for the sector to grow uh i could expect uh because this government has shown uh you know uh, a positivity towards startup that there are certain startup focused uh developments that may be introduced in this budget uh, which will uh, benefit the startup as a uh, whole ecosystem uh and may not ne- necessarily specific to edtech but i think edtech will uh, grow and succeed uh, you know irrespective i think it's a great space to be in this of final thoughts yeah you know i i i think the expectation um from the government it, it would not i would necessarily couple it only to the budget right i think it would be uh, an ongoing dialogue with the private sector uh, to think about what type of regulation is needed yes. we're also seeing the private sector come together uh, you know we talked about some of these uh, uh, practices of selling we've already seen the private sector set up uh, step up and create their own uh, bodies to discuss these and to come up with internal frameworks of of how to go about it because it has been a common theme that has come up so yeah i don't have anything specific to the budget but more importantly just a continuation of that interaction and engagement with the private sector so that 
the short and medium term can leave lead to that longer term benefit for the overall industry like we discussed earlier uh, thank you so much uh, manish ankur and uh, rishab for, for speaking to us uh, kindly stay back while bhavna announces some awards and as i see that this sector uh, edtech is still not a place where anyone wants to exit everyone wants to stay here it's a, it's a sector which is going to uh, grow from here on thank you so much bhavna over to you thank you so much uh, sort of on that and well uh, ladies and gentlemen with this it is time now in presence of our esteemed panelists to start off with the awards as you can see on the screen uh, the best career planning platform and join me in applauding goes to sri chetanya congratulations to the entire team and may we request uh, priya darshini sk head of communications to kindly join us thank you so much uh, and um... great kudos to you team uh, to have put up such a stellar uh, event today and uh, rishab manish saurabh ankur um, it's it's lovely to you know hear you all and you know just when we are seeing that a lot of positive emotions have come with the sector with consortium has been formed and you know um, reiterating that schools are here schools are not just going away with a new fashion to be existing in a hybrid fam, uh, format and things like that glad to say that you know we have introduced 120 high flex classrooms across india in the first phase and just when we are on the growing trajectory going to tier 2 this is one brand that has become an iconic name with 37 years of existence and uh, you know we are just growing and it's it's happy to have getting this uh, recognition and uh, thank you so much we look forward to be associated and do much more Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. This, uh, let's move on and find out the next winner. As you can see on the screen, K12, a school chain of the year regional, and that goes to Green Acres Education Services LLP. Well, for this, uh, if I may request Miss Bonnie Bansali, the principal, uh, to kindly join us. Yes, Bonnie. Congratulations. Over to you. hello everyone um, thanks for putting up this insightful uh, webinar uh, we at the green acres academy believe in giving children access to a wide range of learning experiences skills and areas of knowledge uh, to help them realize their true potential our uh, carefully designed curriculum aims to nurture well rounded free thinking uh, capable individuals who will grow up to be change makers as we want to call them that is agents of positive change for their communities and champions of sustainable development thank you so much for this wonderful recognition thank you and congratulations to your entire team well with this let's move on and find out the next winner the best computer coding education solution and that goes to bright champs well for this if i may request to ravi singh ceo and founder to kindly join us Do we have Mr. Singh? So we we'll just see if uh, Mr. Singh can join us. But let's move on to the next preset, please, for the time being. Standalone School of the Year Regional, and that goes to Canada International uh, School. Well, congratulations, and may I request Shridhar C, the Dean, to kindly join us. Uh, I believe Sridhar is not around. Let's move on and uh, find out the next preset, please. Yes, the best PPP for online skill education, and that goes to Chen Online. Congratulations to the entire team. Uh, let's find out who's the next winner. Dynamic use of artificial intelligence, which is AI in education, and that goes to practically. Congratulations to the entire team of practically. Let's find out who the next winner is. As you can see on the screen, at the best enrollment and admissions management solution of the year, that goes to College Adeko. Congratulations to the entire team, and may we request. Uh, Ruchi Arora, co-founder and CEO, to kindly join us. Ruchi, hi, uh, hi, yeah. hi. You know, on behalf of the College Deco family, I sort of accept this, and uh, you know, we started College Deco with a very strong passion of making sure that we are able to find in this all hard selling and <laughs> and pushing on sales that we are able to get some uh, method to the chaos, and I think we've been able to successfully do that. Uh, you know. 
you know, we just closed our year with almost 100,000 plus applications on our platform by students. So, so hopefully, you know, on that journey to become a full product very soon. Thanks a lot for the award. Right. Congratulations, Ruchir. Uh, well, I believe uh, Mr. Sridhar has also just joined in. Uh, Sridhar, congratulations on the award for candor. Would you like to contribute uh, to your applause as well? Okay. Thank you uh, for the recognition. We are uh, Cambridge and IB school. And the simplest way to put what we do here is our logo, which says preparing for life. So that's what we have been doing it for the last 11 years. We have been preparing students uh, for their lives ahead. And once more, thank you for your recognition. Thank you and congratulations on that. Uh, well, with this, ladies and gentlemen, let's find out the next preset. Yes, the rural skill uh, learning and that goes to skill train app. Well, congratulations to skill uh, train app. Let's find out the final uh, award in this uh, set. The best AI and tech based learning and that goes to Board Infinity. Well, congratulations to Board Infinity and may I request Sumesh Nair, co-founder of Board Infinity to kindly join us. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this award, I think. Oh, well, so, yes, now we can see you Hi, hi everybody. Um, great to receive this award. I think uh, what we do in one line is that uh, we take early career professionals and higher education students uh, who find it difficult to compete in the job market uh, after graduation. They take our short duration courses and kind of increase their salaries by 100%. And in that entire process, they gain financial freedom for themselves and their families. Uh, we've been doing this over the last four years. I think we've been able to impact a significantly large number of uh, customers who've come to us. And, uh, you know, I think uh, tying up to what discussions were done earlier around, uh, you know, why, I mean, how, how we are growing and what is the right way to grow a, a tech business. I think we have always focused around customer outcomes uh, really well. Uh, we're one of the very few companies which having around 88% placement outcomes of the customers who want placements through us and kind of maintained a 65, 70 uh, NPS score till now. Um, I, I believe that, uh, you know, you can build a great education company by focusing on outcomes and uh, um, your brand will speak for yourself when your customer has successful outcomes coming through it. And that's how we have built the last four years. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been growth, insane growth and customer outcomes. That's how we have built it. And uh, I'm happy to receive this award and um, uh, good to see a lot of uh, family faces as well. Thank you so much. Right. Absolutely. Congratulations, Suresh, uh, on that wonderful win. Uh, Ankur, uh, being our panelist, just your word of congratulations to all the winners today. We just request you to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Uh, congratulations, all the winners. It is a, uh, you know, as you're discussing on the panel, it's not a very easy space to distinguish yourself and, uh, you know, achieve what you guys have achieved. Uh, keep doing the hard work. Uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ankur. Uh, Risha, your words of encouragement. Yeah, same. I think uh, congrats to everyone. Uh, this is a great forum to be to be recognized. And and yes, uh, please continue doing all the good work you're doing. Thank you. And uh, Manish? Congratulations, everyone. What you've definitely achieved uh, is great. Like there are thousands of edtech startups that get started every year, but to be recognized and uh, to be given these awards is definitely in itself an achievement. So congratulations and keep keep up the hard work. Right. Thank you. Uh, Saurabh, your final word? Uh, no, thank you so much, uh, Bhavna. I think we have run out of time and I'm eagerly awaiting to hear Mr. Shibunar who's going to come next. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Manish and uh, Rishabh to be, uh, to be here today. Thank you. Thank, so, thank you so much. Thank you to all our panelists and congratulations once again to the winners. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Saurabh rightly said, it is time to move on to the next discussion as we have a great insight coming on the other side. Well, it's a fireside chat going hybrid learning for uh, educational institutes and we're joined by uh, first up our speaker sd uh, shivwal the co-founder former member of the board and ceo of infosys limited in conversation with ritu maria editor-in-chief entrepreneur india and apac well sd shivwal co-founder former member of the board and ceo of infosys Prior to becoming the CEO and Managing Director, Shibu served as the Chief Operating Officer from 2007 to 2011. Earlier, Shibu held a number of senior leadership roles, including the Head of Worldwide Sales and Customer Delivery. Well, it's an absolute delight and honor to have you with us uh, joining. And uh, if I may request Ms. Maria to join us, and let's have a great conversation between Ms. Maria and Shibu. 
Bhubal. Over to you, Ms. Maria, to take it forth. Thank you, Bhavna. And um, it's, uh, I'm really delighted to have the presence of Mr. Shibulal here at the Education Infra uh, Innovation Conference. And indeed, I think with the kind of good work uh, with his philanthropic initiatives that Mr. Shibulal has been doing with uh, the SD Foundation for the education sector is quite exemplary and very laudable. Um, and, you know, they've uh, taken initiatives both at the K-12 education level as well as the higher education level by encouraging more students to uh, not leave their education after schooling, but to continue by offering them scholarships. And uh, more recently, they've also set up the Ed, um, Ed Mentum, uh, which is actually an incubator, a startup incubator, where they're encouraging a lot of uh, digital um, ed tech startups to actually um, and fund them. Uh, to help them grow their initiative. So a warm welcome to you, Mr. Shibulal. It's wonderful to have you here with us. And uh, indeed, we're looking forward to uh, this wonderful chat with you. So let me first uh, start by asking you this, that, you know, um, how was it, how did the calling for education or being part of the education sector come to you? You've been a technology entrepreneur. Uh, uh, you know, you were one of the co, you are one of the co-founders at Infosys. So what motivated you to come uh, and be part of the education sector? You've been doing this since 1990 with the SD Foundation, and particularly you and Mrs. Shibulal, um, you know, we would love to know more about your calling and what changes you wanted to see in the education sector that prompted you to uh, be a part of it. Uh, <coughs> First of all, um, thank you very much for <coughs> inviting, inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here to speak about uh, education. So when we... Um, uh, in late 90s, we wanted to actually start doing something in the social sector. It was very apparent to me and Kumari that education is the best thing to do. There are a number of reasons. Number one, our own background. We come from middle class families. In fact, Kumari is the first girl to go to college from her village. Uh, so I, I got educated. I got my master's from Kerala. Then I got another master's from US. Kumari got educated in Kerala. So the reason where we are today, or we were in 1999, was because of the education which we got um, without really understanding the benefit of it when we got it, and mostly the push of our parents. So it was very evident to us that uh, education is uh, you know, the most interesting field for us uh, because of our background and our achievements. And um, um, you know, once we got into it, we wanted to make so, of course, education is a very vast field. So in 1999, we started out with a very, very small scholarship program for higher education. We felt that there is a lot of work going on in the school education, but people are getting, you know, if you look at the gross enrollment ratio in India today, it is about 23%, 23-24% when you look at higher education. And that happens in my mind because of three reasons, lack of awareness, lack of accessibility, lack of uh, affordability. Right. And we felt that you know we can't address all of them. So we decided to address affordability and awareness. That is how we started our journey in 1999 with the scholarship program. We started with two students. Today, we have close to 5,000 students in the program. We take them after 10th. We take them when they join 11th. We get probably 30,000 applications for 1,000 seats every year across India. We operate in 11 states. And we have hundreds and even hundreds of doctors and engineers and um, nurses and teachers and um, various other kinds of professionals who have come out of the program and today are enormously productive in the country. One last sentence, uh, we did an impact study a couple of years back and we found that anybody who goes through the program successfully is able to pull the family out of the below the poverty line. They are able to bring the family above the poverty line in two and a half years. So that shows the power of, uh, that shows the transformational power of education. Sure, no, and I think that, uh, that certainly, education has always given this opportunity for people to grow um, as a family, as well as being able to elevate their own, in, uh, you know, individual selves, that their generational, um, self to a much bigger height. And I think the wonderful initiatives that you're taking uh, taking would certainly go a long way uh, in helping students to take up education more fervently. Uh, you know, of course, Shiksha Lugam is the digital uh, arm 
um, through which you empower education, particularly, um, I know that the objective of Shiksha Lokam is to empower the K-12 leaders uh, to change with times that we are currently living in. So what kind of transformation is it that you really focus on and what, what do you really believe uh, uh, K-12 needs to change in order to be able to live up to the times and to be able to help the you know, post-secondary education sector uh, because you know, if the kids are not trained right at the K-12 level, they will certainly not be able to do justice at the post-secondary level. So you know, how is Shiksha Lokam coming forward to fill, fulfill that gap? So um, as you know, our education ecosystem is very complex, very diverse, uh, very large, right? You have about 250 million children in the education school education system. You have about 1.5 million government schools, a number of private schools. Um, RT has done a good job of actually increasing the uh, reach of education. I think RT has made it mandatory. Of course, a national education policy focuses, the latest one focuses on foundation learning. All that has happened. So uh, today, if you look at it, the quantity of education has gone up all around. More and more children are in the, in the program. The gross enrollment ratio in the school system is high. But when you look at the quality of education, I think there is, uh, there is a lot to be deserved. Um, if you look at some of the reports, uh, some of the ACE reports, for example, you can clearly see that a fifth grader cannot, do not have the uh, reading comprehension of a second, second grader, or a seventh grader do not understand maths as much as a third grader. So while the quantity of education has gone up over the years through RTE, through various other initiatives which government has done, the quality of education needs to, be, needs to go up substantially for us. Right now, any transformation change anywhere in the world, you need good leadership. Without good leaders who can actually, um, what I call sense, make sense and act. Right, that means they have to sense the need of the um, need of the ecosystem. They need to make sense out of the what they sense, and they need to act and create improvements. That requires leaders, leadership. And if you look at our school system, there has been an enormous amount of effort being put into teachers' education, capacity building for teachers. There is a lot of work going into um, pedagogical aspects, curriculum. Whereas I, when I looked around, I found that there wasn't much work going on in the capacity building for leaders. Now, when I call leaders, it is not one set of leaders. You have actually the principals, the coordinators, the, uh, the CRPs, the DEOs, um, the civil society organizations, the parents themselves. So there is a very large set of leaders who act in this ecosystem. And they need to have um, uh, the right set of tools, the right set of knowledge, right set of um, information to act and to transform the ecosystem. So that is why we decided to focus on Shiksha Logam. Uh, Shiksha Logam started in 2017 as a um, leadership capacity building initiatives uh, for, um, uh, for K-12. Now, over the years, um, Shiksha Logam has, has reached has increased substantially. Today, I believe there are about 4.5 lakh people um, in the, uh, 4.5 lakh people in the, in the platform today. Now, over the years, Shiksha Logam built three different capabilities. Number one, it built a digital core. A digital core, which is actually using Sunbird as a core platform, but it, it built a digital core. Around that, it built a co-creation network. So it is not about we doing everything for the ecosystem. It is about building that co-creation capability, building that co-innovation capability, where people can come in. And the digital core is an open platform. People can come in, they can co-create, they can understand best practices, they can learn from each other. And then we build partnerships. Edimendum itself is a way to build those partnerships. Over the years, today we have about 100 civil society organizations working with us. So that has become the amplification network. So you have the digital core, you have the co-creation, co-creation, co-innovation network capability, and then you have the amplification network. So um, through that, today, Shiksha Logum has, has um, reach various um, various parts of the country. Um, it has various capabilities. It has built um, um, a, um, and also uh, we contributed the entire platform capability and the, and the application capability which we built 
to the ecosystem. So today it is part of Diksha. <clears throat> All the capabilities of Shiksha Logam is readily available in Diksha today, which is the digital, the national nation infrastructure. So in Shiksha Logam, you have four different um, capabilities available. Unnadi, which is a micro improvement capability, Samiksha, which is uh, an observation capability, Bodh, which is a context in context learning capability, and Didi, which is an on demand dashboard. So, Shikshalam is all about building capacity for leadership in K-12 education. Sure. Uh, uh, sir, also, you know, if I were to touch about digital education on the higher education side. So, today we have seen that rapidly uh, students have been taking higher education through digital platforms. Now, uh, you know, when you're not in the campus, when you're not doing practicals, the, the kind of degree that you get is probably very different to the kind of degrees employers have found acceptable earlier uh, in times when, you know, uh, we had all physical education happening in higher education institutes. So now what is your message to both the students in higher education as well as to employers who are looking to recruit young talent? Um, you know, how do they, uh, what kind of values they should place on the degrees and what values is it that they should look for in students when they are actually employing, when everything has around us has been new and digital? So I, uh, you know, apart from this question, I remember an old McKinsey study which said that 25% of the people coming out of our colleges are employment ready. That means 75% of the people are not employment ready, uh, even in our physical world, right? That was the study which McKinsey published a few years back. So, as I said, while the college, we produce a million engineers every year, right? But 75% of them are not ready for employment. So, you really have a huge, huge gap when it comes to um, quality of education or quality of output. I think the technology will allow you to bridge some of that gap. That's how I see it. See, when you have physical education, um, uh, completely physical education, you you are in a sense um, in the same pace. Every student is actually moving in the same direction, in the same speed. There is really no scope for personalization because our scale is so huge. You are talking about a classroom full of students, which is 70, 80. You are not talking about 10 or 15 students. So they really, the ability to interact, the ability to, um, um, to uh, personalize, the ability to customize is very, very low. So if you use the right set of technologies, if you use the right set of um, uh, tools, um, you have an opportunity here to actually personalize. You have an opportunity here to make the learning more um, um, where any time, any place, more importantly at any pace. So I believe that these kinds of interventions can increase the quality of uh, education uh, at K-12 as well as at, at higher education level. But remember, education is not only about content, it is also about character. When I talk about character, I'm not talking about, um, you know, one dimension of character. It is also about, um, you know, life skills, social skills, negotiation skills, work ethics, value system. So when you look at um, use of technology in education, you have to keep this in mind that education in my mind is a contact sport. That means where you come across your uh, teachers physically. So you have to balance the use of technology. I think there is tremendous amount of uh, tremendous amount of value which can be derived from the use of technology. Because if you look at the human progress, technology has played a very very big part, and I don't see any reason why it will not happen in education. At the same time, education is a contact sport. You have to have a hybrid of both. Yes, sir. I think that's that's also something that we have been discussing um, um, in the earlier sessions, the need for hybrid education um, and how it should probably be looking in the future. So you touched upon teaching, um, you know, the teaching skills of the teachers uh, very briefly when you uh, answered the last question. Um, if you could kindly elaborate on it, you know, particularly in India, when you mentioned that 25% of the people are employable, do you think at some point of time, we would also need to work on our teachers uh, to ensure that that numbers can go up significantly? And what is it that we should be doing? And how can edtech play a very important role in making the teachers um, far more capable to be able to uh, give the right education delivery in a hybrid space as we're looking forward for it to evolve. So when I look at the entire value, not the entire value chain of the 
of the learning environment or the teaching environment, I see three different parts. Number one is the learning process, which the students do and the teachers do, because the teachers are also learning on the way. So you have the learn process, which is actually the teachers and the students are both involved. Then you have the help learn process. That is the teachers and the principals and the you know, other members that are helping the students learn. And you have the manage learn process. So you have the learn, help learn, and manage learn. There are three different aspects to this, uh, this chain. And technology can play a very big role in any one of them, right? Or all three of them, really speaking. When it comes to students, you are talking about personalization. You are talking about technologies like AR and VR. You are talking about um, um, you know, uh, blended learning, offline, online, synchronous, asynchronous. Uh, you are talking about anytime, anywhere, uh, learning possibilities, provided you have to address all the challenges with the connectivity and things like that. When you talk about teachers, I think there is an enormous amount of value which um, technology can bring, whether it is about learning, um, the learning process itself, whether they can, um, you know, they can look at new ways of teaching, new ways of pedagogy, new ways of, and also remember when you use technology to learn, your, um, your arena of learning is global. You are not limited to um, local aspects of learning, right? You can actually listen to a lecture conducted by somebody in Stanford or Harvard or in India it's from any other university and learn from it, right? So you can actually create, um, um, you can really access content across the globe and, and, and learn from those, uh, those best practices. Also, it is a very good way to build collaboration. It is, India is a very diverse country. We have so many different languages, so many different regions, so many different cultures. So one solution will never fit all. In fact, one solution in Bangalore will not fit in, uh, in Huzur. But at the same time, there is that, that best practices which can be learned and adopted. So the technology will allow you to do that. You can actually, in, in, you know, we of course run a couple of schools and I tell them to bring in teachers from other uh, institutions into the classroom through the digital um, technology. That would have never happened before. Right? I can bring in an expert from another classroom to the, uh, my, my own classroom. So I think there is a, a tremendous value to be created in the, in the help learn space. That means building capacity for teachers, training them. Also, um, in context monitoring is, is possible using technology. Usually when you train, even if you look at students or look at teachers, uh, while they are learning, you are actually doing base learning in the beginning and base learning at the end. Right, you are not doing uh, in context observations, right? Whereas in, when you use technology, you can look at in context observations and make changes to your response. So the technology can do that without um, human intervention. That means your learning pace is slow, it can slow you down. If the learning pace is fast, it can speed you up. You have a doubt, you are not, you are not clear on some concept, then you can go deeper into the concept. So it gives an enormous amount of flexibility to the teachers and to the students. And of course, when you talk about manage learn, it is all about um, getting one truth in my mind. It is creating one version of the truth. That means what are the learning outcomes? What are the um, um, you know, various um, <clears throat> data points which we collect, right? Uh, for example, in Punjab, I realized, we realized through Shiksha Logam that um, there are more than one, in fact, I think we realize that about 11 or 12 people go to the classroom for observations. And they observe the same set of things from various organizations, right? Various institutions, various uh, government departments, 11 people go into the classroom, they observe the same set of things. We could realize that the moment we apply technology. Of course, you can uh, reduce the number of people going or you can actually rationalize the observations. That will become much more effective. So I think um, in the manage learn space also, I think there is an enormous amount of value which you can create through technology. So to answer your question, I think uh, technology could be a good tool, just like we use it for leadership development. Um, Deeksha actually use it for teachers development. So I think teachers development, capacity building in teaching can be done through technology. Sure, sir. And so also let me um, ask you a little more about, you know, of course you have an investment arm, which is Axelor Ventures through which you invest in various startups. And particularly if I was to talk about, and there's of course Edmentum, which is a startup, uh, you know, uh, incubated only for ed tech startups that you have. So, you know, what uh, kind of technologies is it that uh, you want to see yourself investing in uh, through these, both these arms and 
And largely, if you have any message to young edtech founders, um, you know, about how they should or how they should uh, look at future education uh, delivery, maybe like a decade from now, what, how this- So, uh, right. so Axiom was started with the single most idea to um, make sure that early entrepreneurs should be successful. Because if you look at it, traditionally in the world, one out of 10 startups actually survive the second year. And we wanted to actually, in fact, we had a very humble uh, objective to make it two out of 10, which is actually 100% improvement. And I think we have done far better than that over the years. So uh, it was about um, um, you know, uh, supporting the early entrepreneurs for their journey. Seven years are over. We have a very large number of investments. And um, I think um, we have a very good track record because we have been able to increase that success rate substantially over the, over the years. Uh, Edimentum is not focused on ed techs. They are start, they have, Edimentum is focused on social enterprises. Okay. That means these are um, NGOs. One thing we realized was that when, you looked at, um, when we looked at um, the people, the social uh, sector organizations working in education, we realized that the number of organizations focused on um, on uh, full school transformation through leadership development, what we call whole school transformation through leadership development, we found that the number of organizations focused on that was quite low. So we wanted to encourage whole school transformation and leadership development in K-12. So we said that we will work with 50 organizations in five years. We will incubate 50 organizations in five years so we started in, um, I think, uh, 2017. We had six in 17, nine in 19. Uh, so far, I think in 21 and 22, we took nine organizations each. So um, we operate, we have organizations which we supported in 15 states um, and seven of them uh, out of the 23 organizations, it's a three year program, by the way. And uh, we focus on idea, pilot, scale up. First year, we tried to uh, help them crystallize the idea. Second year, we help them pilot. And third year, we help them um, scale. Uh, we fund them uh, for the one or two years, I think first two years, uh, I think for the founders. That's what we do, so that they don't have to worry about their um, income for the first two years. Uh, seven of those organizations have signed state level MOUs. So, um, for example, when we work in uh, Punjab, we work with um, some of these organizations. We work in various states. We work with these organizations. And uh, seven of these organizations have um, signed uh, state level MOUs and uh, raised about 2.5 crores of funding. So, in the third year, we help them raise funding from uh, either through CSR or through other, other means. Because to become eligible for certain um, CSR and other things, you need a track record. So we help them create that track record sure. the first two, three years, and then they become eligible for funding and other FCRA and things like that. I think we have about, um, um, you know, and I think our organizations, the organization whom we incubated works in about 20,000 schools today across the country. That's the number I have. Um, so um, our goal is to have 50 of them, to work with 50 of those kind of organizations by um, 2023. Sure, sir. So thank you very much for sharing these facts. If uh, we'll take a couple of quick questions which are coming in as you were talking. So there is one question I'm asked by Amit Sharma who wants to know that uh, can we expect government NGOs and edtechs probably coming together in some way to make technology devices affordable and accessible to people at the lower strata of the society? Um, so if you look at India today, I think I remember reading a report which says that you have 67% um, of the households have smartphones today, which was about probably 30% about four years back. So the <clears throat> while the number of devices has gone up, the accessibility of those devices for the students is still low. Because many households will have one device, which is probably, they claim it as one device, but the device is owned by an adult, which means that it is not available for the student to use it all the time. Uh, data continues to be a problem. So there are many, many aspects uh, which you need to address if you want to go take advantage of the digital education across the country, especially in rural areas. Um, you have an affordability issue, you have an access issue, quality of access issue, and um, a device problem. So 
I think uh, there is a need for various actors to come together, whether it is government, whether it is civil society organizations, whether it is um, um, corporations, um, tech organizations. I think there's a need for everyone to come together and um, you know um, try and uh, try and uh, solve the issue. And I'm hoping that they will. Otherwise, um, while we go through this digital revolution uh, in education, which in some sense got accelerated because of COVID. There is no doubt, right? Because the barriers of adoptability came down drastically because of COVID. Um, I remember my own teachers telling me that, uh, oh, uh, Shibu, it's impossible. We, you know, we will never do it. Two weeks before the COVID and two weeks after the COVID, everybody was kosher. Everybody was using online. So um, the adoption issue has been accelerated um, and the barrier to adoption, barrier to acceptance have come down drastically. At the same time, the other physical issues like accessibility, affordability continues to be there. So I'm hoping that various, it is not, it cannot be addressed by one single institution or one single entity or one single sector. It will require um, coming together of various, um, various parties to address these aspects. Sure. So there's another question from Ashutosh Dubey, who says that uh, today, do you think we need more startups uh, which would be working towards uh, or helping students for uh, vernacularization of um, education delivery? Um, yes, I think, as I said in the in some time back, that we, this is, you know, our education system is enormously complex, extremely um, large and very diverse, which means that um, you need um, uh, solutions which are very, very local, very, very contextual, very, very regional, and, and language is a very, very important part of this. Um, so uh, it is very important to have um, enough capacity, um, whether it is startup capacity, whether it is government capacity, whether it is teaching capacity, I think there is enough, enough capacity um, which will, um, create those capabilities. Um, you know, um, language is not the only challenge, right? You have other pedagogical issues which you need to deal with. So <clears throat> it is very important to um, make sure that we have enough capacity to um, handle this diversity. Sure. Um, sir, so now with your warm presence here, we would also like to give away some education uh, innovation awards and I would request Bhavna to please join us uh, here and uh, if she could kindly do the, um, and sir would facilitate the awards. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chibulal, for joining us and what an impactful fireside chat this has been. Without further ado, let's go on to our awards. Could we have the first preset? Yes, and uh, right on the screen, uh, well-deserved Lifetime Achievement Award goes to Mr. S.T. Shibulal, co-founder, Infosys. I would request everyone to applaud and give as much energy as possible. Thank you. And with this, uh, we definitely request you to say a few words, sir. Congratulations, uh, Mr. S.T. Shibulal. I, I don't know. Yes. I am... Uh... I am honored and um, a bit surprised actually, uh, but I'm I'm very honored. It's indeed a privilege to um, get an award. I actually receive it on behalf of uh, my wife, who actually spends most of the time uh, on this matter. Um, but we do it jointly. But I will I will receive it on behalf of both of us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations on that. Uh, with this, uh, we're going to move to the next preset. As you can see on your screen, the best robotics for learning education school uh, solution goes to ORCID, the international school. Congratulations, ORCID, on that. Uh, if I may request Naresh Ramamurthy, head academic products, to join us. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me over, and, and uh, this is a this is a privilege and an honor. And uh, at ORCIDs, we. Uh, we, we really care about uh, providing a, a good quality STEM education. Uh, I would say STEAM education. And uh, in uh, specifically for robotics, what we do is uh, we have robotics kits right from grade one onwards all the way till grade 10, which is integrated into the curriculum as a subject. And uh, children learn to tinker and play with uh, you know different tools uh, and, and uh, they build uh, bots as early as you know grade three. And uh, this is something that uh, we felt was uh, very critical and we, we've been working towards it. 
and uh, thank you for recognizing this and uh, you know honoring uh, us with this award. Thank you so much for this. Absolutely, congratulations with this. Uh, let's move on and find the next preset on the screen. Let's find out who wins it. Requesting the team on the next preset, please. Meanwhile, we hope you all are having a great time. As you can see on the screen, EdTech CEO of the year, and that goes to Mr. Mr. Gaurav Munjal, CEO, and Academy. Well, congratulations on this uh, incredible win, uh, Gaurav. Uh, with this, uh, let's move on and find out the next win, please. Yes, the excellence and innovation in online teaching, and that goes to 21K School. Congratulations to the entire team. Let's move on and find out the next win, please. Well, the entrepreneur of the year, and that goes to Mr. Mihir Gupta, co-founder and CEO of Teachment. Well, congratulations to Mihir uh, with this requesting you to join us on the stage and screen. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Babna. And this is uh, this is a great recognition. Really humbled uh, and and grateful to see this. Uh, really excited to see that uh, education infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure for education, is being recognized uh, at this stage at the larger level. Um, I think uh, we took a radical bet uh, uh, one and a half years back on focusing on uh, uh, educators uh, and creators and teachers rather than students, uh, and and that is something that has uh, that has really created massive impact uh, in terms of millions of teachers in India adopting uh, digital tools uh, along with the Teachment platform. Um, we were just talking on this forum on what technology can do for uh, for teachers, and that is exactly the space uh, that we are in. Uh, so really grateful and and this this award goes to hundreds of teachmates uh, as we call the teachment team here and and the teachers uh, uh, millions of teachers on the teachment platform thanks a lot absolutely congratulations being here on that uh, well with this we go to the final set of awards in this set could we have the presets please well the most uh, breakthrough uh, product of the year and that goes to npar congratulations to npar on that uh, well could i request sushil munjekar founder and ceo to kindly join us thanks then uh, the entrepreneur india for giving this award and we humbly receive that uh, the society which is so obsessed with marks and grades uh, we actually took a, a dent four years back uh, in terms of nurturing entrepreneurial mindset among children and uh, how do we uh, do that. Uh, when that time it was more of a luxury and uh, kind of extracurricular activity today, fortunately, uh, things are coming importantly, uh, you know, taking entrepreneurial mindset as one of the important crucial life skills, uh, building and blending a curriculum around design thinking, uh, technology of the future for children to use that as enabler for innovation and then entrepreneurial mindset are some of the cores to uh, uh, empower. Uh, we once again thank a lot for this kind of a thing, but this recognition strengthens our belief in the road that we have taken. Uh, I must also humbly uh, dedicate this award to the resilience of the team in power and all the thinking coaches that we have around the country uh, who just uh, keep uh, only doing two things, loving what they do and doing what they love. Thanks. Absolutely. Congratulations, Sushil, on that. Uh, well, with this, let's move on and find out the final few presets in this set. Well, the most immersive uh, learning product of the year, and that goes to immersive uh, learning quiz. Congratulations to the team. Let's move on and find out who wins it next. As you can see on the screen, emerging product or service for home-based learning goes to Kuduki. Congratulations to the entire team out there. And uh, let's find out the final uh, winner in this set. Well, the best STEM solution for uh, K-12 that goes to SmartWitty. Congratulations uh, to the team out there. And with this, uh, we conclude on this uh, set of uh, winners. Thank you for joining us. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, before we uh, exit, uh, we just like uh, words of encouragement from Mr. Shibulal to all the winners today, of course, uh, with the Lifetime Achievement Award going to you as well. Just your final words. Over to you. Uh, once again, I think it was a pleasure for me to be here and also to receive the award. Uh, my congratulations to all of you. I think, um, um, you know, if you look at our country, um, uh, um, 
we are in some ways at the threshold of the next uh, wave of development. Uh, I see the next uh, 50 years, um, a period where India will achieve its um, um, rightful place as a developed nation um, in the world. Right? I believe it will take us a few years, but I think we will get there in the next uh, 30 to 40 or 50 years. And in my mind, education will pave the foundation, will be the cornerstone of this strategy, cornerstone of this journey. Uh, we are a very young nation. We have uh, a very large um, uh, demographic dividend in our favor. At the same time, it can be a liability if we do not provide them with the right opportunities for education, skill building, employment. And that is where all of you are playing. That is where, uh, while you are building companies, while we are building so, uh, civil service organizations, while we are doing what we are doing, we are building a nation. We are building and uh, we are empowering our youth. Um, we are building a nation. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. And with this final set of words from Ms. Maran. Um, a big thanks to Mr. Shibulal for really uh, showing us the vision for what we are doing, going to be doing as a nation uh, in the times to come. And I think education sector would probably change the entire landscape of how India is probably going to grow and uh, envision their careers, uh, the young India, of course, um, in times to come. So thank you, Mr. Shibulal, for joining us. And my many congratulations to all the award winners and, of course, to Mr. Shibulal for being the lifetime for the Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations once again to all the winners and thank you Mr. Shivalal for your time and all uh, the expertise and intelligence you brought to the conclave. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, uh, what an uh, what an excellent fireside chat that was and uh, we had greater wins right there. Let's move on to the next uh, discussion. Uh, on campus, off campus, making students ready for tomorrow. This session will be moderated by Ms. Punita Kapoor, a deputy editor on Entrepreneur Magazine. And uh, joining uh, Punita would be our speakers. Uh, first up, uh, Dr. Balakrishna Gandhi, Dean uh, Global MBA and MGB, SP, uh, JN, uh, School of uh, Global Management. We've got Professor Rajesh Khanna, President, NIIT University, Dr. Sachin S. Varnekar, Dean and Director, Faculty of Management Studies, Bharti Vidya Peet University. We've got a Professor Amrinder, uh, Joint Director, Central Institute of uh, Educational Technology, which is NCERT, and we've got Dr. Raj Agarwal, Professor and Dean. EIMA uh, greater than CME. So congratulations first, once again to all the winners and thank you to all our panelists for joining us with your value time. With this, I pass on the live waiting to Ms. Punita to take it forth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pavna, for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, with the Omicron variant being omnipresent, more colleges and universities today are making major changes in how they'll reopen for the next semester. And considering this time frame, we have a very topical topic to discuss today, which is on campus and off campus, making students ready for tomorrow. And for this, we have a stellar panelist lined up for you to answer any, many of your questions. And before that, we would like to get into the discussion mode with all of them. So welcome all of you. And uh, with this, I would like to, with considering the paucity of time, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Agarwal, who is a professor and director of IMR CME. So Dr. Agarwal, uh, to start with, uh, you've been in this profession for more than 35 years and you're also visiting faculty at various international universities. So are there any learnings which you think we can draw from international universities to understand how to make our students <clears throat> ready for the future. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me in this uh, prestigious uh, conference. I was listing the keynote address and your award function, and I really find it uh, very inspiring. And um, definitely, this is a good initiative by your organization. As far as this um, student's uh, readiness is considered, and then linking with the with their employability, linking with their employment, and linking as a good citizen of this country, there are the various aspects uh, which needs to be taken into consideration when we when we talk about new education policy or be, when we talk about uh, about the prevailing education sy system in our country. 
first and when we talk about uh, the compre comparison international comparison so then first of all that uh, in an ecosystem the kind of this uh, development industrial development this uh, development of the services and then development of agriculture uh, and then development of this uh, small scale industries so as far as this providing this employment that is very very important now this first of all this uh, the kind of this growth rate uh, which we are achieving definitely this is commendable but when we compare this growth rate with the in a context of the kind of this uh, uh, students which we are uh, coming out each and every year then we find that there is a need that further this uh, growth rate that can be accelerated because this has happened in so many developed nation growth rate was higher and then this employability that too was very high and uh, then uh, side by side this is what that this comp demographic uh, uh, composition this is again an important factor so here this is what that in what way um, msme sector in what way services sector in what way this is agriculture sector this is growing up this is first important part and second important part which is widely talked in so many studies that this is the employability part so then definitely when we take into consideration international system then we find a big gap between theory and practice so means that this industry interaction in terms of this creating competencies creating right kind of this youth in campus Uh, for that purpose there is a need that there should be a comprehensive faculty development program because when we know and when we are aware that faculty is not industry trained or faculty has not integrated into interacted with industry so means that how faculty members they can develop the right kind of this competencies right kind of this uh, this uh, this uh, skills among students so then definitely this is the second important challenge third important challenge which is is very important uh, from that particular context uh, context of this new education policy that in a country this role of regulatory bodies like ugc like this aict in terms of creating a kind of the right kind of infrastructure uh, not by intervention by providing autonomy so then there can be a sustainable development of education center uh, system now in our country there are the variety of colleges variety of institutions variety of uh, universities and likewise this today just now i was going through a news of this times of india this uh, this is what that this aict and ugc will come heavily mm, this is what that as far as ed tech companies are considered so while giving this recognition or while uh, while the while taking into consideration qualities of these companies uh, so so again you see that um, although the, there is a time for this budget presentation and in last budget uh, there was very little that was given to the education so now there is a time that we should take very proactive steps as far as creating that kind of environment in this budget also so then uh, we can implement new education policy and then we can we can create the right kind of environment as far as this employability as uh, employability of students those who are coming out from the campus is considered yeah so these these are my initial remarks so sure. thank you thank you dr agarwal for sharing your concerns i will come back to you further on this to move on i would come I'd like to come to you dr gandhi uh Dr. Gandhi, what are your views? I mean, uh, about adding value to the career of students as well as professionals. Would you like to tell us more about your experience of making them ready for the world? Sure. Thank you, Punita. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, a Gandhi and noble, not the noble Gandhi. Okay. I have an <laughs> R in my last name. So okay, not it. Uh, <laughs> thank you for. Uh, giving me this opportunity uh, punita the edtech i think is doing a brilliant job of nurturing you know edtech companies and uh, they are going to be adding immense value uh, in nurturing uh, students and growing the economy in the long run sp jain is a boutique business school and we focus only on management and we do not have any other allied schools 
The COVID has caused enormous anxiety amongst all the stakeholders of an educational institution, be it students, the parents, and the corporates that we are grooming the students for. We believe the most significant stakeholder here is the corporates. To me, they are the customers and we need to take their anxieties into consideration. COVID has you know, uh, destroyed the ability of the companies to create st stakeholder value. They have been fighting for survival. A recent McKinsey study has shown a study of CXOs across the globe that nearly 87% of the CXOs felt that they're totally unprepared to handle you know, the COVID and they don't have the capability and they have a lot of openings. The reality today is there's no jobs crisis, but there's a skills crisis. There are a lot of people looking for jobs but the kind of skill set that is needed to handle the post COVID management challenges are completely different. What is it like to be able to add value? They need to you know, work, cope with the ambiguity, manage uncertainty. To me, it's like you know, the corporates in a boxing ring you don't know where the opponent is going to give you, you know, land his punch. You have to be continuously agile, nimble, ready to respond and duck and avoid the punch. And this is the situation, the corporate arena. So what we have done at SPJN is we have revisited all the elements of an academic program. We have revisited the learning outcomes all the faculty we have huddled uh, together uh, in uh, multiple Zoom sessions. And uh, fortunately with us, we have a large percentage of faculty who are from the industry who are consultants. So they could bring in the anxieties that the corporates are having, blend it with the theoretical concepts and frameworks and deliver high impact learning. So what we teach, how we teach, and you know, uh, the pedagogy, the assessments, everything has been revisited because we are under enormous pressure. We have been ranked the fourth best in the world for a one year MBA program. And we need to stay there or even get better. And being a boutique business school, agile and nimble, we have been able to do that. And uh, we continue to do that. And it's a learning exercise for all of us. Thank you, Parikh. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Grandi. So coming to you, uh, Professor Khanna, because uh, Dr. Grandi spoke about a certain skill set. So I would like to ask you, uh, how are you developing the curriculum that needs to be theoretical and experimental? And how do you develop it in accordance of the coming future? Uh, thank you, Benita, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, see this problem of not being prepared for future and what skills are required. Uh, this is just one instance, you know, the current one, where we had issues with uh, social distancing, people falling sick, the capacity going down, and in-person teaching that we have all developed over centuries. Uh, you know, just remember, we, we had, you know, special places where students would go and cut away from every, everywhere else like mm -hmm. group. So starting from there, we are now in a place where we are, you know, just, just online teaching. So, so the challenges have been huge, but uh, to just address this particular challenge, uh, you know, we at NIT have taken a view that this will only be limited in scope. We don't know what future challenges are going to come. In this particular challenge, thankfully, you know, we could overcome this by digital methods. And uh, our earlier preparation with online teaching, hybrid teaching, which we were already doing, you see, because of our curriculum. So that held us in good stead and we could deliver the content and the teaching. So that uh, the process wise of, uh, you know, the aspect of delivering was never a problem for NIIT University because we were already there. 
So for a full one year, we ran as a completely digital university where we did everything on time. We could, we could delivery. So the delivery part was our you know, very strong point. We were already doing it. But as uh, uh, Dr. Grandi said, we need to revisit and we need to see that uh, an undergraduate student who, who you know, goes through certain courses, certain practices and gets ready for the industry is, uh, is, is, is the skills which would be required uh, will change. We don't know what skills would be required, uh, you know, even with all the McKinsey reports, we don't know what skills would be re required in 10 years time or 20 years time. And a mm -hmm. student, you know, doing undergraduate now is to be productive for next 50 years. You know, just imagine, you know, 50 years later also, he'll be productive. His skills would be, he should be able to have the skills that would be required at that time, you know, 50 years from now. So the problem of solving the current uh, deficiency in skill is probably not the right way. The right way would be to break it into, uh, so at NIT, what we have done, the right way for us was actually to break the skills into fundamentals and then see that these fundamentals of physics, chemistry, maths, biology, and you arrange them in a particular way. And then you take make this journey from these fundamentals to skills and have test cases on that and then have stories around that and have examples on that, have projects on that. And also do the reverse where we pick up an industrial problem and we have a set of students from, from final year, from third year, from second year and first year. Mm -hmm. And then they are interacting with, with the industry people. And uh, then they're trying to solve that problem and demanding what knowledge is required to solve that problem. So one of them would be the CEO of that you know, particular startup kind of thing, which will be you know, designated to solve that particular problem. Somebody would be doing the marketing part. Somebody would be doing the physics part. Somebody would be doing, you know, the maths part. And these will all be, you know, students spread from final year to first year. So in that sense, they are intimately connected to the problem, which is the current problem because it's coming from the industry and they're demanding and they are then being taught the fundamentals. So that journey from problem solving to fundamentals, because see the fundamentals are not going to change so much. So the fundamentals of physics, chemistry, maths, bio, philosophy, you know, economics, those will remain. So we, those are the knowledge sources and that's our best bet. If we can then morph these knowledge sources to a problem solution, that is, that is the best we can do with the present generation. So if you talk about students, the best thing would be to show them how a complex problem of the outside world from outside the, in the corporate world, uh, from outside the school setting can be solved by the principles, the fundamental principles of education or, or the knowledge sources. So this we have done, we have been doing at NIT and this year also we did that. And there are many, many examples where we have been very, very successful because we looked at the, the fundamentals from these set of students who have gone through this routine to see mm -hmm. how much they have grasped. So their learning capacity increases and the ability to gather these things to make a solution. So if you see, this is like triangulation, you see. So they know A, they know B, but they can then combine A and B to generate C, a new knowledge. And this is our best insurance against uh, future uh, challenges because skills currently, we know digital skills are required, cloud computing is required, Manufacturing robotics, that is required. We know cybersecurity is important. We know uh, digitalization, how to convert you know, companies to be in a digital world uh, and how to you know, make use of all that. You know, all those things that we need today, uh, we can take care of, but we don't know what, what more would be required. Maybe you know, in future, we require a you know, lot more of space science. You know, for, for the last 20, 30 years, space science was something which was taught only to, and very few people opted for it. You know, we even have a joke, it's not space science or it's not rocket science. You know, when we say something mm -hmm. is very elusive, but maybe in 10 years time, this is what we'll need. So what kind of physics would be required and what kind of mindset would be required to think about those things? So these change, these things change, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, other than digitalization, which is not even a, a separate subject now, it is so 
immersive. It has it is so you know ingrained in everything we do that it would probably be uh, not right to call it as a separate thing. I mean, it's it's we are all now digital completely. So uh, for these new skills, we don't know. Nobody knows, you know. Uh, and and we can say, you know, that we can predict that, but it's very difficult. So we latch on to the knowledge sources. We have a generation who knows how these knowledge sources can be converted to a new skill set or to a knowledge. So at that fundamental level, and to make that process very quick, so that learning process very quick, making use of a hybrid mode, flipped classrooms, uh, technology, taking away the constraints of you know, time and space, uh, and, and all those flipped lectures, everything, you see. And that, that's what we are doing at NIT. And to my mind, uh, that is our best bet. And uh, so I leave it at that. And, and uh, that that's kind of ensures against any possible thing that can come. So thank sure. you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Professor Khanna. We'll come back to you for more such information. So uh, talking about insights, uh, Anish, I would like to come to you because uh, you've been a flag bearer of learner-focused education. So what more insights you can share about uh, how this uh, uh, changing times have uh, been at times professional learning and uh, how are you uh, I mean, uh, dealing with them when talking to your students? Thank you. Thank you, Gudita. And uh, I must say it's been a very enlightening afternoon uh, listening to uh, Mr. Sh Mr. Shivalal earlier and to all the uh, very, very highly qualified panelists on this show. Uh, I am uh, uh, probably unique in that respect that I am probably not, I'm probably the only non-traditional uh, HEI participant I belong to, uh, depending on your point of view, either the much celebrated or the much maligned EdTech uh, uh, part of the part of the spectrum. Uh, but, you know, the, the challenge that we see especially from a learner point of view, is that, see, the Indian learner has traditionally seen the root of education as leading to a productive uh, life, right? And that's, that's the whole Saraswati leading to Lakshmi kind of argument. And in both pre-COVID as well as in post-COVID times, uh, our challenge has been the same. The challenge is that of access affordability and awareness. And these are the points that Mr. Shibulal has made as well in his uh, keynote address. So I think one of the big challenges that we have as a country, especially in the context of our slowing population growth, in the context of our lack of infrastructure uh, for formal education, in the context of our dismal uh, you know, employability data of graduates, and equally dismal dropout rates from both K-12 as well as higher education. The debate is not so much about whether it should be on campus or off campus. I think the debate should be how can we as an ecosystem come together and ensure that we are able to pull many more students into the formal higher education bracket and leading them into employability. So as Times Professional Learning, we try to be the bridge that becomes uh, you know, a protective net for students who have either completed their graduation and are looking for employability, or they are working professionals uh, who are looking for upskilling uh, to be continued to be relevant uh, in, their, in their careers. So it's a, it's a very interesting mix. And I think as uh, Dr. Grandi had said very eloquently, the customer here is the employer. And uh, it is in the acceptability of uh, the employer that all our modus of higher education will ultimately come to rest. So I think it's, it's very critical that as a system, we come together and we start redefining how we look at learners, how we look at uh, learners independent of the mode of learning that they have acquired their degrees or diplomas or certificates through, and really look at how we can create a physical stroke, digital stroke, hybrid environment, where the quality of skills that we impart as a higher education system to the learner really adds value to that learner and really adds value to industry as a whole. And I think it's there that the focus will lie going forward. We are going to become a multi-sided platform 
and we're going to become a platform where the voice of industry will be heard much more in academic circles and vice versa. So I'm really looking forward to the debate shifting from off campus on campus to, hey, what is it that we can actually do to fix the fact that too many of our students, too many of our young adults in this country do not get the chance to become productive citizens of this country. So that's that's where we come in and that's where we hope to continue working. Thank you, Punita. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, those insights. So coming to you, Dr. Sachin Vernikar. Uh, Dr. Vernikar, you've been part of uh, an expert committee of 400 institutions. What kind of changes you have seen across them? Can you share further on this? Yeah, uh, Punita ji, thank you. I must congratulate at the very outset the entrepreneur education and your entire team for bringing the eminent personalities on one planet. I fully agree with all the uh, eminent panelists. And as you rightly pointed out, I must tell you here that in this hookah world, that is, which is volatile and the pandemic has proved how volatile this world is. In this hookah world that is volatile, uncertain, a lot of complexity and ambiguity. So every student, every one of us, if we feel blessed, only when we feel blessed, when we are blessed. So everyone wants to be well blessed. And therefore, he will or she will feel blessed and he is not stressed. Now, today in this hookah world, everybody is stressed, as very rightly pointed out by various uh, personalities. That the corporate world, the students, the teachers, everybody is stressed. Though they are well blessed. Now, a uh, good school blessed, a good business school if you are blessed, and then good job you get, you become a successful entrepreneur, you feel definitely blessed. Otherwise, stress. And today, the entire world is under stress. I just want to, instead of going theoretical, I just want to uh, emphasize what exactly uh, we do at Bharti Vidya Peet Institute of Management and Entrepreneurship. So, uh, as very rightly uh, pointed out by Anish Ji, uh, instead of on campus and off campus, from beginning at our Bharti Vidya Peet, I'm Dean Faculty of Management. What we have done is we have ensured that the activities we organize, one of the best activities that we have is Industry Institute Partnership Summer. What we do under this is we invite the corporates, the HR managers, the CEOs, the academicians, and the students. And there is a panel discussion. And we try to find out the skill gap, what industry expects. As, as it has been pointed out, only 25% of the graduates are employable. So we are trying, the skill sets are very, very important. We are trying to find out what are the skill sets that are required by the industry and what we academic institutions are offering. And based on that, we designed the syllabus. And very importantly, with the corporates, as very uh, rightly pointed out by Grandiji, the corporates are our customers. We have to tailor our uh, curriculum, our activities to the needs of the uh, corporates. So what we do next, is very important. Why we did not find it difficult at Bharti Vidya Peet to switch on to uh, digital world uh, is in March 2020 when the lockdown was declared. Fortunately, the very act various activities that we have been doing, like seven tire counseling, five tire feedback system, CWTED, that is community work through entrepreneurship development. You are into entrepreneurship and uh, promotion of entrepreneurship. Let me tell you. Everybody who is well placed in a family, good family, good school, good business school, he feels blessed. But there are many who cannot join because of their financial position, poor background. They cannot join the various educational institutions like us. So what we have started, and this is the unique activity we are doing, and that has really helped many self-employed people, this small entrepreneurs develop themselves. What we do under this is we ask our MBA students to join hands, whether it is a Panipuri Wala or a very, any a carpenter or anybody, a small entrepreneur on the roadside, we teach them what is cleanliness, what is Sachu Bharat, we tell them how, do, how can they market, and all these guidance is given through the, by the faculty, through the students to them, and there is a handholding, and the student ensure there are two advantages. One is we are developing them, helping them develop their business, and students understand what kind of hard work these people are putting. Because 
generally the mba students when they come immediately after the graduation they want a, a car a big salary and all that but when they see these people uh, working and join hands they understand me so this is the cwtd that we do the digital hub that we had developed we had integrated moocs the online courses in our curriculum so we had already trained our faculty to go for the online uh, courses moocs etc and that has really helped and one more important thing i must tell you the five tier feedback and seven tier counseling at every stage pre admission to uh, from admission to alumni we ensure that they are done complete counseling and that has really helped in this pandemic particularly in this hookah world that has really helped us we have collaboration you had asked a uh, important question to raj agarwal ji and very rightly pointed out by him we need to uh, in the light of the uh, nep national education policy the vision of the national education policy is to develop the global citizen sense of belongings towards the country and cross cultural relations so what we have done we have gone for many collaborations 30 plus you know cities in the world so that students go there there is a faculty exchange there is a student exchange they understand even in this pandemic fortunately because of the digital setup digital hub we could continue that student exchange in the faculty exchange very important is the corporate day the alumni day the industry visit the blended learning the joint research project that we do we have made it compulsory for the students to uh, write research articles so we are trying to develop their aptitude and attitude towards everything and there are many we ours was the first university in india to start cyber security as a course to start digital uh, sorry disaster management as a course road safety and traffic management as a course so we see what is the need and accordingly we develop our students our placements have never been a problem it's always 100% but what we emphasize on is entrepreneurship development the institute is trying its best to develop the entrepreneurs so that they can face the future challenges they are future ready and they will always feel blessed so this is what we are doing not only we are focusing on faculty development the management development and the students also the holistic development of the students is emphasized at imd so if we go ahead with this i don't see any problem for the students to face future challenges so these are the practical things we are doing thank you very much have a great day thank you thank you dr venikar must say these are some real life examples <coughs> you have shared so coming to you uh, professor amrendra bahera who is also joined by us uh, who happens to be the joint director of ncert professor bahera you have been involved in developing various courses and training for media students so how inclusive you think are these uh, considering today's changing times thank you very much madam punita can you hear me yeah um, for some people to interact with the uh, whole world on these issues whether on campus or off campus ultimately it is quality can you hear me properly yes yes i we can hear okay, you okay thank you very much and as far as the uh, nep 2020 is concerned it has given a lot of stress on digital technologies whether on campus and off campus and in the pandemic situation also we have shown through diksha swayam e patshala uh, even nistha integrated training for 8.5 million teacher itself has proved that technology uh, is there to help and whether it is on campus or on ca off campus uh, it hardly matters but there are some alarming areas challenging areas like uh, we have 26 crore children in school education setup so if they are at home their experiential learning and competency development is a major challenge so in that case we need a platform like uh, pal personalized adaptive learning platform so starting from registration to certification to credit transfer to uh, uh, work uh, becoming making them workforce so whole tracking and uh, monitoring and helping every child uh, to uh, acquire basic uh, skills and competencies is the key so in a way artificial intelligence or robotics ai uh, even machine learning need to help us uh, because india as far as scale and uh, the equity and the quality is concerned 
even the diversity is concerned whether linguistic cultural or geographical because we have more than 1700 languages in the country more than five distinct language families aryan dravidian uh, austroasiatic tibeto burman and andamanese so having digital content in indian languages is also key uh, so we need to develop content in those areas and in covid pandemic situation when children are not accessing the labs so accessing labs and virtual labs because again dissection of frog is banned in our classroom so environmentally so in that case how virtual labs can help us to learn science to learn mathematics and to learn languages and social science so even if we are talking about recreating history in the classroom or learning history so how cellular jail in andaman nicobar island is connected to history and uh, taking a virtual trip to that similarly if i am talking about geography so uh, having uh, the mud volcano in andaman nicobar island and watching it live is a challenge for every child but if we have a uh, video or live video uh, recorded and uh, children they see and they recreate the volcanic eruption in the classroom and uh, think so in that way uh, AR, ar augmented reality virtual reality virtual lab are key factors for learning uh, providing them experiential learning and uh, competencies and again uh, why i am saying tal uh, personalized adaptive learning situation because in pandemic situation you might have seen that board examinations also it was difficult for us to uh, hold board examinations and based on marks they have acquired earlier and the children were marked so to reduce that if child on every day basis is monitored the progress is monitored through ai based platforms uh, and uh, which is compliant to ndr Uh, national digital education architecture developed by government of india the ministry of education and the ministry of electronics and it so that will be more meaningful even the india talks about 32 building blocks so uh, which is connected in including the teacher the deployment transfer posting and all so those needs to be monitored online uh, so that uh, we prepare them and reduce their uh, managerial work and uh, uh, help them professor bahira i think teaching in win situation could be win win situation for all the stakeholders so uh, that is why we need to join together whether it is government corporate csr uh, ngos uh, even startups and the volunteers so we need to converge all our uh, work uh, program policies and schemes and reach out to the stakeholders in a meaningful manner like assistive technology is another area so there are uh, 21 uh, different variety of disabilities in the country nearly 10 crore population uh, who are uh, having uh, one form or the other form disabilities and including not a, starting from visually challenged to parkinson so in that case how assistive technologies in the form of talking books audio books even sign language videos even braille uh, text uh, speech to braille um, uh, so those kind of self help how startups can help us to do that because we, if we expect that everything only the government can do so india skill it is always a challenge every time so because 26 crore school children uh, including higher education 33 crore children 1 crore and more teachers so the policy talks about uh, continuous capacity building of every teacher uh, for 50 hour, um, uh, hours every year um, uh, so uh, in that case uh, how uh, assistive technologies uh, even the uh, learning management systems and the content management system in a better way they can help us to design learning and to track children even certify them and also credit transfer is possible since the policy talks about no hard separation so in a way and talks about multiple entry and exit so in that case how we can make uh, such learning more enduring and technology whether it is on campus using blending uh, of face to face or digital like some some of the speaker they talked about digital also both digital and physical so how we can have a hybrid approach to reach out 
and in a time bound manner whether it is a teacher student parent children with special needs including a gifted a gifted child in the schooling system has every right to be nurtured and uh, to be given double promotion or uh, maybe uh, um, nurturance with experts in the area of sports games science technology space so they need to be nurtured also so a multi pronged strategy Uh, needs to be adopted so no shortcut no concrete solution um, uh, one uh, one uh, uh, set fit for all or one plan fit for all cannot uh, uh, do that thank you very much for giving the opportunity thank you over to punitai thank you thank you professor behera for uh, sharing those insights so before we open the uh, platform for audience q and a one common question i would like to all ask all of you because uh, we're all sitting amidst the pandemic and uh, with this how has uh, the entire course which you developed the entire curriculum whether it's through experiential learning or theoretical has changed uh, in the last two years i would like to hear uh, insights from each one of you on the same so professor khanna would you like to start uh, first yeah i would um... see at nit university we are uh, offering uh, courses in computer science family uh, electronics and communications engineering uh, biotechnology and management so uh, as it happens except for biotechnology and uh, some labs in uh, electronics and communications the computer science courses could be i mean they were very well suited for uh, online delivery uh so in that sense we for the for the kind of courses we were offering uh, the pandemic had uh, not disturbed us so much because the biotechnology courses uh, also there is a huge element of bioinformatics the way we offer them so so the so there also uh, i mean the effect was because as you know the education is is in in two ways one is the content in the so there is a formal education that happens through courses and everything but there is an informal education that's a major part that happens uh, you know outside the classroom so that was completely missed so we could do justice with the content uh, with the delivery but the impact was was uh, you know to the on the student i think they suffered the the, the i mean it's it's i mean who who can there's no no way to hide behind this we have realized that you know this uh, immersive learning coming to the campus you know and uh, staying with your friends and and in the classroom whether it's a computer science course or a or a mechanical engineering lab or a civil engineering lab which are you know would require lot of uh, experiments physical experiments you see the quality that the student gets and the opportunities they get is is heavily compromised you see so so we we did well in terms of giving them the skills that are required the professional skills but at a personality level uh, you know the huge gap now uh, and plus there was this huge um, uh, effect of the pandemic itself on the on the way people think now on the people's personality and it was a huge shock so so that intervention also you know has a huge role and there was nothing to absorb it you see people were left to their own devices their uh, i mean devices uh, the pun is intended um, oh. and and the family uh, and and there was no support system you see i mean the government of india did so much to 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 have this manodarpan initiative and i mean that is the you know the the extent of the problem uh, of the psychological problems and how people are going to grow up and what kind of individuals are we going to get after four years Uh, so that is uh, remains to I mean that has a huge you know gap there. Uh, on the other hand, you know NIT because it's a fully residential university. So for yeah. us, we couldn't do the things that we wanted to do. So but we we will see you know the time is still with us. The students are connected with us, and it's not just four years that we remain connected to them. We, we remain connected to them later also. So while uh the content wise the skill wise uh, it was good personality wise you know huge huge gap and we plan to make up for it thanks so that's a very valid point which you have mentioned uh, dr agarwal coming to you your view point uh, 
uh, yeah, this is a very good insight. Actually, you see that uh, this uh, we conduct uh, mostly this um, off uh, this uh, this distance learning program, this online program, so off campuses, and that too for the working professionals. Mm -hmm. So here uh, we appointed this uh, AIMA council has appointed one task force uh, under the chairmanship of uh, uh, Dr. Primat Sinha and Professor Rajan Saxena by including all the uh, top uh, academicians from India as well as from, uh, from industry also, this industry professionals. And then we conducted a survey. So this is what that, what kind of this skills competency and what kind of changes are taking place. So first thing which uh, we find it out to be noticed that this uh, hybrid mode this is going to be a reality in coming time so then definitely this uh, the kind of this advantage which we are having in this online uh, online learning that we have to include within this hybrid system this is the first thing we have noticed so through and then secondly this industry this uh, there is a transformation in industry industry is towards uh, towards digitization impact of this uh, industry for revolution is very much there the nature and character of the jobs are changing. Yesterday we did a uh, did a uh, webinar with the IIT professors for launching launching a program uh, and with industry people. So we and that too focused on digitization, digitization and transformation of enterprises and organization. So we noticed that currently what industry is looking, industry is looking uh, along with long term courses, this MBA program and all. But major emphasis is on the short term programs. This is what that uh, six months program, three months programs, or even one year program, one year program, and three months program, and that too in a focused area. This is AI, this is MI, this is design thinking, this is uh, this is this transformation of this in, uh, the, of enterprises. Uh, uh, so this uh, consultancy, this we launched this consultancy uh, consultancy program. So this program became very very popular. So in these kind of programs, even not uh, in private sector, but in this government sector this we have a collaboration with world bank and then we are launching uh, launching this programs on this procurement we are launching program on this contractual dispute management we are launching program on public private partnership so uh, so we find that there is a overwhelming response uh, from government go go government officers there is overwhelming response from public sector enterprises and as well as from pri uh, pri private sector in these kind of programs and definitely there is no doubt that this uh, our long term program like uh, this pgdm uh, pgditm two years program so as professor khanna uh, was rightly pointed out that uh, here we have to struggle very hard uh, so, but what is the what is what we learned out of the research survey which is going to be released on 30th march by the education minister what we learned that uh, you see that um, even in this uh, full time even in this uh, this two years program there is a need there is a need to align it completely with the requirement of industry uh, industry and definitely this is what that uh, this uh, this if we are going to align with the requirement of industry whether this is a online whether this is a offline uh, so definitely this is going to give us a, a tremendous advantage sure. <clears throat> thank you coming to you mr anish uh since we were all asking all our panelists about their viewpoint and how the last two years have changed uh, the course curriculum uh, because of COVID and how uh, the entire theoretical and experiential learning is being relooked and being redefined by institutes. So want to hear from you, what are your viewpoints? I think it's a, it's a great uh, uh, transformation that uh, my company went through. Uh, because you know we were uh, conducting a sort of a hybrid uh, teaching and learning uh, experience across 21 of our learning centers in India pre-pandemic. And when uh, the lockdown was announced, in about 48 hours, uh, we moved this entire operation consisting of thousands of students, both uh, in the employability sector as well as in the upskilling sector, into a completely online learning management system. And while I uh, completely agree with Professor Khanna on the challenges uh, that were there, I think one of the things that 
my faculty and my uh, managers were very cognizant about was the level of engagement that we needed uh, with the students while delivering an online program. And I think, you know, uh, given the very object oriented sort of uh, sort of uh, programs that we are running. Uh, so we most of our programs are very specific to a uh, can you work in a bank or can you work in an IT environment? Uh, or if you're a working professional, can you acquire the specific skill? So we were able to really mix and match our theory practice with a lot of experiential learning. And we were also able to engage with our employer partners. And in that sense, as I said, we were a multi-sided platform. So we were able to get the employer partners to uh, you know, provide a bit of an on-the-job training uh, to our people while they were going through the curriculum itself. So I think these things make a big impact uh, because you know if you're if you're looking at a real life application of your learning while you learn, I think there cannot be a better uh, way of handling this. Also with our IIM and IIT partners, we are one of the large edtech players in this space. Uh, we were able to compensate for a lot of the on-campus immersions that were part of the course curriculum. We were able to compensate with hackathons that my team conducted. We were able to ensure that there was, uh, as far as possible, no lack of skill focus, no lack of application focus during the course. Uh, of course, the challenge of you know not being able to physically interact uh, and not being able to get the kind of peer-to-peer -peer experiences that you would have in a physical learning environment, those challenges remain. Uh, I think that post-pandemic, uh, there would be a re-emergence uh, of, uh, you know, a hybrid learning environment where there would be opportunities for students uh, to, you know, at least occasionally meet and interact with their peers as well as with their with their professors uh, while uh, continuing to consume a lot of the learning in an online mode. And I think that's uh, a healthy balance uh, going forward that we will look forward to. Anita. Sure, <clears throat> thank you. Coming to you, uh, Dr. Veneker. Would you unmute yourself? Yeah, when the lockdown was declared in March 2020, the what was very, very important was uh, shifting from offline to online. And Digital Hub that was uh, already ready, which was effectively developed, we could use that and we declared and informed to the students there will be no lockdown for learning at Bharti Vidya Bita. And uh, fortunately, with the seven tire counseling and five tire feedback system, we were constantly in touch with this way with the students and what was very important was the uh, communication because in this uh, in this pandemic very very important the uh, was that we wanted our students to be physically fitter mentally balanced and well prepared to face the future challenges particularly in this so we ensured not only the curriculum curriculum fortunately it is well designed we have many electives from marketing finance hr business analytics to digital marketing HR analytics and what, what industry needs. The important thing what we did is considering the requirement of the industry, we focused on the skill development. And we approached, we were approached by edX, a platform uh, which offers the online courses from Harvard to Oxford to IIMs and IITs. So we immediately joined hands with the edX and we offered the online uh, skill development courses, which was free for that time. And many of our students immediately joined because upskilling and upgrading their skill was very, 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 very important. And we focused more on the add-on courses, value-added courses, the MOOCs, and particularly this edX came to our rescue. And we, very importantly, uh, particularly the, where all the activities, I, it was a blessing in disguise. If we have to invite the international guests or the professors from different parts of the world, in the uh, offline mode, it is very difficult because it, costs a lot, there are so many permissions, their availability. But what we did, we took it as an opportunity and we had many international conferences, international webinars, and we had faculty from Rome to Canada, to Australia, to US, and we got them 
uh, online and we could give excellent uh, inputs online to the students. Similarly, alumna, alumna connect, international connect, industry connect is very important for any BCA. So what we did, even the alumna who are different parts of the world, so we could connect them and they were readily available. Coming to entrepreneurship there again, our one-to-one, -one, because we have identified excellent entrepreneurs who are very successful, we identified them, we, request the, we requested them online to guide our students to go for the entrepreneurship. And many of our students could take the advantage and the entrepreneurs as well. So the blessing in disguise, particularly the international uh, online, online programs and all that we did. And as a result of all this, you will be surprised, the placements were not at all affected. We got everybody placed. Many of them went for the entrepreneurship. And this is how it has helped. So we are going to new make the blended learning because now the future is of blended learning. Whether you go for the offline or online and all that blended has to be there. And the effective use of this we have to do so that students are skilled enough and future ready. Thank you, Punidaj. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Behera, uh, your viewpoint before we move to audience Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Punita ji. Actually, uh, when COVID approached in March 2020, uh, we were uh, running in NCRT only one channel for the school education sector and only 18 radio channels we were running. Uh, for the whole country. One of the COVID approved in May launched the Prime Minister's eVidya program. So, I did one platform provide all digital content Professor Behera, your voice is breaking a lot. And the coherent as digital education is concerned. So, NC class one child. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, we can hear you now. Hello. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Maybe connectivity issue. Can you hear me? Yes. So, we started the 12 TV channels as one class, one channel, and uh, uh, for two, each class up to class 10, we had a two hours fresh slot, and uh, it is repeated 11 times for children, so that any time conveniently they can watch, because we cannot force them to watch in a particular time. And besides that, uh, we had a, a large use of radio, even community, lot of community radio stations, around 80 radio stations, and uh, 132 radio stations, all together 230 radio stations across the country we used, ensuring that it reaches to whole population geographical location. So 230 radio stations we are feeding. Besides that, Diksha, a large number, around 6,000 videos, 3,000 audios, we developed class-wise, subject-wise, and populated on Diksha. And the same content were available on TV and radio, as coherent access content. Mm, uh, there is noise in the background. Uh, eight minutes. Uh, hello? Uh, so uh, that is why uh, we used Diksha also and more than 6,000 videos and uh, 3,000 audios through our partners. Like uh, we had a partnership with Rotary India and uh, they provided a large number of content also as part of part partnership and similarly children with special needs they were also or whom we needed to uh, misgather the content and develop the content. So that is why we collaborated with Indian Sign Language Institute uh, the, uh, in collaboration with them. And to start with the class, class one to five, we thought that it's, if it is a primary level is addressed, so we did for them. And all NCRT books, they are developed in three digital forms, EPUB, Flipbook, and uh, 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 PDF. So uh, the EPUBs helped the visually challenged child 
uh, to listen to ncert book even we had a partnership with google for uh, uh, collaborating to uh, work uh, with google assistant and uh, digitize all textbooks and provide through google assistant so that children can uh, listen to the book because it, the screen time was also crucial even ncert developed the, uh, the digital education guideline popularly known as pragyata and also guideline for uh, the cyber safety and security because there were lot many teachers uh, teacher educators they were using that so uh, these steps were taken and uh, popularized also and the continuous capacity building uh, uh, professor bahera there is a lot of network issue at your end so uh, you can conclude at this point in covid pandemic situation we were supposed to scale 42 lakh thank you thank you dr bahera uh, uh, professor bahera okay so continuous capacity building of teachers was a challenge it was through diksha so through diksha thank you all right thank you uh, thank you so much uh, everyone for your time we are running uh, quite short on time so that's why we'll have to conclude the session uh, thank you for being with us today and showing the path forward for the education industry forward over to you bhavna Thank you so much, Vineta, and thank you to our panelists. So, well, we'd request all our panelists to please stay around as we call the final set of awards, and we'd love to have an applause from your side as well as we encourage all the winners to join us. Uh, so, could we have the preset, please? Well, the first one, which is the best uh, edtech solution of the year, and that goes to Eruditus. Uh, congratulations to the entire team. And uh, with this, uh, let's move on to the next one, please. The best learning platform in performing arts, music, dance, drama goes to Crayer Play. Congratulations to the entire team as we applaud and acknowledge their efforts. Uh, with this, if I may request uh, Dushan, the co-founder, to kindly join us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Entrepreneur India, for this honor. Crayer Play operates as a digital, digital stage equipping over 10,000 K-12 students with critical communication skills through theater and storytelling. We're thrilled to receive this award and which will, I'm sure, motivate us further to continue on our mission of enabling every student to find their voice and stage their stories through theater and storytelling. I dedicate this award to the entire Career Play community, my co-founder Kuzema and the founding team Akshaya, Yugesh and Karthik, all my early stage partners, our school associates and students, friends and family who have been with us through thick and thin. Thank you once again, Entrepreneur India for this uh, wonderful honor. Thank you. Congratulations, Ashan, to you and your entire team. Uh, well, with this, let's move on to the next one. It is uh, the most interactive program by a preschool, and that goes to Mind a Seed. Congratulations to the entire team. Uh, let's move on and find out who gets the next win. Well, as you can see on the screen, a Best Employability Award, and that goes to Times Professional Learning Private Limited. Well, with this, uh, congratulations to the entire team. May I request Anish? Uh, Sri Krishna, CEO of Times Professional Learning Private Limited, to kindly join us. Do we have Anish joining us? Well, I believe in case if that has to happen, uh, we'll go to the person. Uh, I, I can see Anish actually on the back end. Anish, if you can hear us, would you like to unmute? All right, let's just move on to the next preset, please. Yes, the most emerging higher education institute of the year, and that goes to Plaksha University. Well, congratulations to the entire team. And uh, with, with this, let's move on and find out the next win. The best college of the year, BBA, BCom, BA, BSc, and that goes to St. Paul's College. Well, congratulations to the St. Paul's College, and could I request Dr. Thomas M.J., Principal, St. Paul's College, to kindly join us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anupam India, for uh, conferring the best college award to St. Paul's College, Bangalore. Uh, this is such a proud moment for all of us at St. Paul's College as we receive this uh, recognition just in the fifth year of the institution. And I would like to humbly acknowledge the support and contribution of uh, every stakeholder of this institution, the management staff, parents, and students who constantly support 
uh, and for striving to live and promote the values and principles of that this institution holds high uh, and for constantly realizing the motto of the institution that is creating uh, professionals for a better tomorrow and we look forward to your continued support and encouragement and uh, as we believe together uh, we can achieve greater uh, greater heights in the coming years uh, once again thank you entrepreneur india for holding this uh, education innovation awards and from st paul's college we wish the entire entrepreneur india all the very best thank you thank you and congratulations well with this uh, let's move on and find out the final uh, two winners in the set could we have the next preset please the best testing and assessment solution of the year and that goes to infinity learn by sri chaitanya classes well congratulations to the entire team and uh, may i request uh, priya darshini sk head of communications to kindly join us thank you babna and uh, thank you ritu uh, for uh, providing us uh, this opportunity and congratulations to entrepreneur india as a whole team to putting up a stellar uh, show today and you know the event is very very commendable to bring in the whole you know uh, entire strata of the uh, industry on one kind of a forum having said that uh, infinity learn is a protege of shri chaitanya which is a 36 year old uh, you know uh, largest educational group of asia and within 6 months of our existence you know we have done some belligerent steps um vis a vis to you know reach out to students today the platform has 10000 students coming every week to pursue various kind of thing well known for you know uh, catering to the uh, professional courses we have started with the test preps and you know the assessment uh, kind of a platform but we also give out a holistic kind of a supplement education from school um we're not an on online school but you know um definitely definitely moving into that direction and with all the kind of encouragements that we have received i bet we're just on the growing trajectory so thank you so much and congratulations once again for all Right. Thank you and congratulations Priya Darshini on that wonderful win to you and your entire team. Well for the final award in this uh, let's find it out as you can see on the screen institute with the best placement and that goes to NIIT. Well congratulations to NIIT on that wonderful win. Uh, with this ladies and gentlemen it was the final award in this set we'd like to really humbly uh, congratulate all the winners and uh, as we have punita uh, on the screen punita your words of congratulations to all the winners whilst we go ahead with our final uh, talk over to you thank you thank you babna and uh, very many congratulations to all the winners and for rising the next chapter in education thank you thank you and congratulations uh, dr raj i believe he's on mute no worries yeah, yeah you want yeah. from me sir some Yeah, you are addressing me. Yes, yes, nothing, nothing. Uh, we're any which way a little bit uh, tight on time, sir. But uh, thank you for your presence and thank you and congratulations to all the winners. Congratulations, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, thank you. It was much. really a nice program. I really thank you. Did. Thank you. Well, with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, an event so great uh, like this, uh, and in the presence of Miss uh, Ritu Maria, who's you know uh, been uh, so patient from the very start, it is time for the closing remarks. Well, for this, uh, we're elated to be joined by Dr. Neeta Varma, Director General, National Informatics Center, MEITY, Government of India. Dr. Neeta is the Director General of National Informatics Center, a premier science and technology organization of the Government of India. With a career spanning over three and a half decades, she's been somebody who's been instrumental in implementing high-impact digital initiatives across the country. With this, we'd like to humbly welcome, on behalf of Entrepreneur India, Dr. Neeta Varma to join us. Uh, Dr. Neeta, could we now have you on the screen, please? Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to address an august gathering of professionals from the education and technology sectors. As I contemplate the significance of education, I recall a story from Japan that surfaced in 2016. A railway station that was set to close due to low passenger count was kept operational once the authorities realized that it was being used by one girl for traveling to her school. The station was closed only after she graduated. Such is the significance of education that the global communities acknowledge. Education plays a pivotal role in development of the country in every aspect, be it social, cultural, moral, or economic development. 
education seems to protect poor and marginalized from exploitation by generating awareness about their rights, their capacities and their capabilities. It also helps them in economic upliftment by making them employable. But above all, education empowers the people, enables them to make choices, take informed decisions about themselves, helps them dream big, evolve from job seeker to job giver, aspire to be an entrepreneur like many of you in the audience today. Education, therefore, is a core area of public policy, national as well as international deliberations. Millennial Development Goals to Sustainable Development Goals of United Nations have education as an important dimension. While Millennial Development Goals focused on universal primary education, Sustainable Development Goals talk about quality education. Likewise, countries have their policies to support their educational institutions, their teachers, as well as support their students. Universalization of education is one common theme across all these policies. In India, Ministry of Education, Government of India is working towards enhancing the access to affordable and quality education to more and more children. Various schemes launched by the ministry are directed towards providing universal education to, to uh, universal access to education for all segments of society. Some of them include Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan, Prime Minister Portion Scheme, Rashtriya Uchitar Shiksha Abhiyan, Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, etc. And on the other side, there are programs such as National Digital Literacy Mission, Pradhan Mantri Gram Digital Saksharta Abhiyan in Digital India. These programs are empowering the citizens by training them to operate computers and digital devices. Lot of schemes are also in operation to motivate children to come to school in the early years through incentives in the form of midday meal, scholarships, uniforms and books. In India, lots of volunteer organizations, foundations, not-for-profits are also very active to promote the cause of education. All these initiatives had a significant impact over the years on our education ecosystem, but we still have a long way to go. There are gaps in quality of education, learning outcomes across geographies. Access to affordable and quality education is the goal. Affordability and quality often do not go together and therefore large number of children from smaller towns, children from poor and marginalized sections are deprived of quality education. We all have seen significance of child education in our families. Parents make so many sacrifices to afford good school or good tuition for their children. Children will shift from small towns to schools in big cities, stay in hostel to get quality education. Same is true for engineering and medical entrance coaching. There are pockets in cities like Delhi where these students stay to prepare for their entrance exams and then their cities like Kota. All of this have a lot of financial stress on the family and emotional stress on the children. And the fact is, very few kids can even afford this. So the challenge is how do you provide quality education at an affordable cost at a scale? As I said, quality and affordability often do not go together. But the good news is technology enables us to move on this convergence. Role of technology in education was realized long ago. However, our digital infrastructure at that time was not ready to leverage this potential. Launch of Digital India program by Honorable Prime Minister in 2015 propelled the growth of broadband network in the country. Mobile users also grew exponentially. This opened up a huge opportunity to solve the long pending problem of universal access to quality education. Further, induction of technology in our day-to-day -day operations 
introduction of AI, machine learning, automation, bots started changing the profile of employable skills. Thus, need for reskilling existing professionals, existing workforce also became a necessity. This all led to a large number of startups and other companies focusing on the domain and thus gave rise to edtech industry in India. I am told India is one of the top 3-4 countries in the world as far as edtech companies and startups are concerned. India also has emerged to be among the top 3 countries in the world after China and United States to get the most funding in the sector. EdTech industry was beginning to make inroads in our conventional schooling but largely supplementing school education. COVID-19 pandemic and associated lockdowns led to the physical closure of 15 lakh schools that has affected more than 26 crore students for almost two years with small interventions in between. Like in all walks of life, Technology remained the only choice for continuum of education. The pandemic had promoted, had prompted educational institutions, teachers, students and parents to embrace online learning like never before. Several edtech companies across India have been have risen to the challenge and lots of new platforms, features on existing platforms to support virtual online classroom were launched during pandemic and it is strongly felt that demand for education platforms, virtual classrooms and its other avatars will continue to grow in the times to come. Primarily because cost of online education is lower when compared to traditional education, that means going to school or college. There are numerous e-learning platforms already available for students where they can access to quality education at an affordable cost. Because of the affordability factor, students from different socioeconomic backgrounds can get access to quality education from best of teachers. For the new education, uh, new national education policy 2020 aims to integrate technology at every level of instruction. Online learning got a major push from the national education policy that promotes online education to achieve the 50% gross enrollment ratio. Government of India had also set up platforms like Swayam and Diksha to promote online learning in the country. Swayam is designed to take the best teaching learning resources to all including the most disadvantaged. Swayam enables students to access all the courses taught in classrooms from class 9 till post-graduation anywhere at any time. Diksha is a national platform for school education that can be accessed by learners and teachers across the country and is available in different languages and cuts across syllabus of NCRT, CBSC and some state boards as well. Another dimension which brings a lot of promise for ed tech sector is the growing internet user base. There are around 735 million active internet users in India, which is much larger than collective population of, of quite a few countries in the world. Having said this, there are challenges also because we still have um, around 300 to 400 million uh, people who have to be connected, who have to be brought on the internet, who have to be, be able to afford the smartphones to be able to take benefit of these uh, online courses and digital education. But the good point is that um, but the good point is that with, with, the, with the announcement by Honorable Prime Minister that fiber will reach to 600,000 villages of India soon having a stable connection and with Atmira Bharat getting affordable phones will soon it looks to be reality in the near future. Now, when we bring, once we have access and we've been able to provide access to these online courses to to children in across um, across urban and rural areas, then there are then there'll be new kind of challenges which we have to face, or I should say, there are new kind of opportunities which will come. 
The first is the content. EdTech is not only about technology. It has content plays a very major role in this. And, and when you bring and, and, and in this, making this content available in different Indian languages, in different di dialects is a domain which still needs to be, which, which still has a lot of work to be done. It can, but the good point is that in India, we have large number of good educators and teachers and teaching is considered to be a noble profession and we should leverage on this scenario and really um, bring all these teachers and and leverage their potential to create this content in different languages quickly. We also have option of using technology solutions for this, though such language technologies have matured in few many foreign languages and some of the Indian languages, but large number of Indian languages still need to be uh, to be refined. A solution needs to be refined to be able to do a machine uh, translation. But having said, this is also an opportunity where a lot of work can happen in making this content available because that is that is one of the core area where a tech industry has to work to make this content available in in different languages in India to make it truly inclusive or to make that ambition or our vision of universal access to education a reality. Then going forward, uh, going forward, so far, largely the focus of the education has been on um, the school education and then the skills of professional courses uh, which uh, for reskilling purposes. But there are a lot of other domains where we have started seeing some startups really coming into this, but there is a, there's a huge scope in that area. Things like gamification of education, um, application of AR and VR technology to make learning an enjoyable experience, particularly when we talk of concepts or when it talks of learning the skills, it, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be very, very useful. So that's another domain where a lot of work still needs to be done or we should say it's a work in progress. Lastly, um, the, the true power of online learning or digital technologies in education will come where we can make, when we can make education as a personalized phenomena. Basis, because every child is unique, every child will have is his own set of understandings, his own set of uh, context from where he or she is coming. Therefore, we need to uh, we need to personalize education to to really maximize the learning outcome of that. And uh, and with the kind of new set of technologies, I am sure uh, there are a lot of startups who are working in this area and who are building algorithms, who may already have algorithms to achieve this thing. But now I think question is that how do we really bring them on scale so that every child, every every individual gets benefited by this. And it is, a, and it has, it, it has a huge potential of improving the learning outcome as well. And, and I feel once we achieve this, this will also democratize education in true sense and help us meet our objective of uh, universal access to uh, affordable access to quality education for all. Um, you know, as they say, there's no better gift than education. And therefore, I would like to compliment all of you for your commitment, your dedication to build solution to impart quality education to every child, a dream we as a country have been aspiring for long. So I salute your commitment and your dedication to this domain. I also would like to thank Entrepreneur India for inviting me to this and giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you and, and wish all the best for future de for further deliberations. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for that incredible uh, closing remark, uh, Dr. Neeta Verma. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this brings us to the end of the second virtual edition of the Education Innovation Summit and Awards 2022, organized by Entrepreneur India. It was an honor hosting, and we would like to once again thank the partners and sponsors also, you may share your feedback with us directly on marketing at the rate entrepreneurindia.com 
or to any of our editors, you can mail it. On behalf of Rithya Maria and her team at Entrepreneur India, a shout out to all the team members who've contributed in making this uh, summit and awards a success. Well, for now, uh, this is me, Bhavna Bhatia, signing off for today, and we hope to see you in future of our events at Entrepreneur India. Please do follow us uh, on our social media handles and stay tuned uh, with our upcoming events. Thank you all for joining us.